Okay, uh, first on the agenda, we have a presentation by GatePath CEO, uh, Brian Nider. Probably easier to use this. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. Can you hear me? All right, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about GatePath. We're a 100-year-old organization, uh, celebrating our 100th year right now. Revenues are about 22 million. We're one of the largest providers of services to individuals with developmental disabilities uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, and at 22 million, that puts us in the top 2% nationally for nonprofits. We have 13 locations in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties and over 300 dedicated staff members. And we reach about 15,000 families and individuals every single year. Our core, core programs serve roughly 1,200 individuals on a daily basis. <clears throat> Oh, wrong way. Let me do this again. Operator error. Um, we provide a lifespan of services. So we start with early intervention. We provide therapy services, occupational, speech, and physical therapy. In addition, we have three inclusive preschools uh, serving roughly 300 kids in an inclusive setting. We have adult programs. We have a family resource center. Uh, we have employment programs. So we see kids in the very beginning when they get a diagnosis and all the way into adulthood and seniorhood. Our mission, vision, and values, our focus is really on acceptance, respect, and inclusion for people of all abilities. That's really what our mission is all about in everything we do, providing opportunity for those that we serve. Happy to say we have a great relationship with the city of Millbrae. Uh, you know, we provide an opportunity, like I said, in our preschools for kids to learn and grow together. We have hundreds of children reading, re, uh, receiving therapeutic and family support services every year. We have community access and group volunteers here in Millbrae with local businesses, and I'll have a slide here in a second that shows you some of our local supporters. And we have uh, employment and community partners right here in Millbrae as well. So we've got the Magnolia, which is an employment site, uh, Target, Trader Joe's, uh, we actually work with the uh, Millbrae uh, Rec Department, so it's great to have uh, community support for our mission of inclusion. And we're very, very appreciative of that. So one of the things that, just to make everyone aware of that uh, where we can use support, is around uh, a cooperative living and housing model. We just opened up a co-op housing in San Mateo. It's the first new housing and cooperative setting for adults. Uh, in San Mateo County ever. And it's a, 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 you know, we know about the housing crisis generally, but the folks that we serve, it is really very, very serious. Uh, in San, Santa Clara County, in two months, uh, six homes closed, which is 36 individuals without a place to live. So us being able to add 10 new beds in San Mateo was a big win uh, for individuals. Opening up employment opportunities, looking for volunteer opportunities, access to facilities like we have with uh, Millbrae, with Parks and Rec is really important. And then improving state and federal funding. People may not know this, but California, fifth largest economy in the world, is 50th out of all 50 states in per capita funding for individuals with developmental disabilities. Last time I checked, California is not 50th in terms of cost of living, so you can see what the impact is for the folks that we serve on that lack of funding. Voter accessibility, uh, and that would also include now with the census. So we're working closely with San Mateo County overall to ensure voter access and for census, uh, making sure the folks that we serve are part of that. And last is just improved transportation options for the individuals we serve uh, so that they can have full access to our community at large. And then on May 14th, depending on how things evolve with the COVID-19, we're currently planning to have our big Power of Possibilities event on May 14th at the uh, uh, Marriott Airport, and we'll have Henry Winkler as our MC and Dr. Temple Grandin as our keynote speaker. Oh. So this is an event we've been running for several years, and this year is obviously for the 100th celebration, a big, big deal. So I'm happy to take any ticket purchases if anybody wants to come up to me after we're done. It's a, it's a big event and an incredible celebration of the folks that we serve. Uh, uh, just a little snippet, we have the individual we recognize each year in our employment program. It's a gentleman who works at the uh, airport Marriott. He commutes four hours every day to work and never misses a day. He comes from the East Bay for two hours in the morning taking four different transportation connections. Wow. To get there, he walks from Millbrae over to the airport Marriott and has perfect attendance for his job. I think everybody would love to have an employee like that. 
So we're going to recognize him and his good work at Marriott this year. And it's always a special event to see the folks that we serve being called out for their commitment to their job and their community. So with that, thank you again, Mayor. Thank you, Council members, for letting me share our story with you. Again, 100 years is pretty remarkable for any organization, and we're proud to do the work and serve a wonderful community right here in Melbury. Thank you. One last acknowledgement, uh, we have the Gate Path Auxiliary, our president for the auxiliaries here. The auxiliary has been supporting our mission for 70 years, which is fantastic. It just occurred to me to add that my disabled daughter, who's 36, has been involved with Gate Path since she was two. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you could just wait there just one sure. moment, please. A couple of uh, commendations for you. Great. I may ask for a paparazzi here to take a quick picture. Sure, yeah. Jim, mm -hmm. would you mind? There's the camera ready. All right. Okay. And whereas uh, Gate Path, a nonprofit established in 1920 to improve the health and welfare of children with de developmental disabilities in San Mateo County, celebrating its milestone 100th anniversary in 2020. Whereas over the years, Gate Path has developed a large portfolio of services that today support individuals with special needs and developmental disabilities of all ages, from infants to seniors. And whereas Gate Path, with 300 dedicated staff members, provides direct services at 13 locations in both Santa Clara and San Mateo County counties, whereas Gate Path, now one of the largest nonprofits serving the disabilities community on the peninsula, impacts more than 15,000 families, caregivers, and individuals each year with its programs, whereas Gate Path's lifespan of services include developmental screenings for children, early intervention, and pediatric therapy, uh, inclusive preschools, social and recreational opportunities for youth, employment training and placement, as well as community integration and independent living skills for adults, whereas Gate Path is very proud to celebrate 100 years of creating a world where people of all abilities are accepted, respected, and included in all aspects of society, from the classroom to the workplace, and is committed to ensuring inclusive opportunities are available for all decades to come. Now, they are for we, the members of the Millbury City Council here in Dubai, congratulate and commend Gate Path's 100th anniversary and Gate Path Auxiliary's 70th anniversary. Thank you so, so much. So thank you very much for uh, the important need that you we fill do, in the community. Yes, the yeah, <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. I guess so. Oh, right. um, but you obviously serve an, an incredible need here in the thank community. You. And uh, we appreciate all the hard work you do and look forward to continue working with you. And we'd love to have you back uh, at a future council meeting as thank well. Thank you. I'll be back for the 200th anniversary. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> right. Yes. Let's stand actually in front of the podium. Can we have uh, Marta Bookbinder from the League of Women Voters join us at the podium as well? I must be the news. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So um, we celebrated an important um, day the other day, Women's International Women's Day on March 8th. And uh, one thing that's very important here in, in the year 2020, it's actually the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, um, guaranteeing the women's right to vote across the country. Um, so obviously a um, huge uh, landmark and uh, wonderful to be celebrating 100 years. Wish it could be much longer than that. But um, we greatly appreciate you've been able to join us here tonight. And uh, also for the, all the work that the League of Women Voters does to increase voter participation and provide uh, valuable information to, to voters. Um, whereas in 1975, during International Women's Year and United Nations, United Nations began celebrating March 8th as International Women's Day. And whereas International Women's Day is a time to reflect on progress made, to call for change, and to celebrate acts of courage and determination by ordinary women who have played an extraordinary role in the history of their countries and communities. And whereas during this historic year, 
2020, we celebrate the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution, votes for women ratified and signed into the record. And whereas in 2020, the League of Women Voters celebrates its 100th anniversary, and the League of Women Voters of North and Central San Mateo County joins more than 700 other local and state chapters to celebrate this historic milestone. And whereas as we look to a vibrant future on the threshold of our next 100 years, the League members across North and Central San Mateo County continue to recruit and invite members and activists who share the League's commitment to making democracy work. And whereas the League's historic commitment to register, educate, and mobilize voters is not only stronger, but more effective than ever, utilizing such tools as Vote411.org, a cutting-edge election information website utilized by millions of voters each election cycle. Now, therefore, we, the members of the Millbury City Council, do hereby proclaim March 8, 2020, as International Women's Day and the centennial of the 19th Amendment, and congratulate the League of Women Voters on their 100th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you very much to the council members and uh, to the public just here. Uh, yes, my name is Marta Buckbinder. I'm the president of the North and Central San Mateo County League of Women Voters. So you come within our area. So it is a pleasure being here and having you present this for the many reasons. But more than anything, we have members of the league present here today. And Ms. Uh, some of them, we had a celebration, and some of them have served the League of Women Voters for 50 years or more and one of them for 70 years or more. So we expect to be here in the 200th anniversary. <laughs> all right, but it is a, a, a service that really helps all of you as you run for office and all of the public as they make a choice who they want to vote for or what they want to vote for. And uh, there are so many tools that we have developed. One of them that is not mentioned often but is very crucial is the Easy Voter Guide that brings together the the, the ballot arguments or what is being proposed and gives the pros and the cons for the person to know, to read it in a very simple language and then to make a choice in what is it going to cost or what is the actual consequence of voting yes or voting no. And it makes a big difference and, and the public really asks for it. This year we have it in five languages. We had it for the primary and I believe we're going to increase that for the November election to ten languages. For many people who may not have English as their primary language, this is very important because it really gives them true access of information if they need it in the primary language. I am an immigrant I was an elected official, and it, it makes a big difference. So thank you so much for celebrating with us. It, it makes a, a tremendous difference. Yes, thank you. Um, and congratulations as a former league, as a former board member. This is, is terrific. For the audience who may not be familiar with the league, they do the pros and cons. They're a nonpartisan organization. It is not Democrat, Republican, Green Party, anything like that. And growing up, my mom just celebrated her 50th year, and her award up here is a lifetime member now. So mom is in the audience. Uh, she used to bring uh, voter registration forms to the libraries, work on candidate debates, and the propositions the pros and cons. Uh, they do an amazing job. They also, and they are always looking for new members um, of all ages, and men are welcome too. Um, we did a, uh, you had a program here in Millbury. They happened to meet in Millbury once, about once a quarter. No, we meet every month. No, but you're in Millbury about once oh, a quarter, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah, so they meet up in the Millbury Library, and a few years ago they had somebody talking about the history of women, um, the, the suffrage fight. So a tremendous book that Mom has read. I haven't had a chance yet, but hopefully we'll be doing more uh, activities over the course of the next six months or so on uh, women achieving the 100th right to vote. And, you know, even big things like uh, Time Magazine has come up with... Their 100 list of influential women, the covers that could have been. So um, we've got a ways to go. I think the most amazing thing that we learned here is that women are not often represented in public places. So I am very happy that the city manager has agreed to let the city work, and we hope to work with the league on some kind of commemorative plaque for the city to recognize the 100th anniversary. So, um, Mayor, sorry, I know we always like to keep moving, but I'd love to have a picture with anybody who's a league member or a woman who votes. Let's, let's get a group picture up here. Come on, that's with the uniform in the red. 
There you go. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank <laughs> you. All right. Stand up in front of the podium, please. Come forward in front of the podium. Yeah. No, 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 no. Mom, you're coming back this you're way. You're too short. All of you are coming forward. Right next to the podium makes a good block. Here you go. No, you got to come forward. Okay. 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 Good. Now we'll cut it off. No, no. This will go in the next one. It's a corner. She's right there. Who's tall? Nothing. Real time. Right here. We might want to read. Still nothing yet. That's it. You see everybody back here? Still five. Yeah, there's a couple people who. Come on forward. You guys also have enough room to spread out a little bit. To your right. To your right. And to your right. There's enough room right there. Here. Why don't you? Right there. Don't forget, if you want to join the league, we welcome men and women. Thank you. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I can make a quick announcement about that if you'd like. I'm sorry? Oh, do you want to? Sure. Or, two of the things that we're doing for to celebrate the 100th anniversary of a woman's right to vote in federal elections. In California, we actually got the right to vote a year earlier. Um, and believe it or not, our county was one of two counties or, that heavily fought it, San Francisco being the number one county that fought to, have, to allow women to vote. So interesting how, how communities turn themselves around. Um, we're looking at trying to bring in some materials from the U.S. Congress uh, U.S. Library of Commer Congress. Bar Association, right? I'm sorry? American Bar Association? Yeah, American Bar Association, but in conjunction with the uh, U.S. Library of Congress. So we hope to have that display. We're working on some other activities. And if any of you are out there and want to help us, help is more than welcomed. Uh, we're looking at August in there. August is our council uh, vacation in theory, but it is the actual anniversary, although California signed the paperwork in June, if I recall. So we've got a couple of dates we can try to time this around. Um, it's just a great dear, and for young people out there, um, your vote matters. Get out there, register. There's a gr bunch of great things to be voting for this year, so please vote. Okay, thank you. All right, next on the agenda, we have the uh, agenda overview and staff briefing. Um, city Manager Williams. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Holliber, members of the City Council, Tom Williams, City Manager. Um, before I get started on my report, I'd like to bring to your attention uh, a couple of addended, addendum items uh, for staff reports in the purple folder. Um, item number seven, uh, there's a table that's been revised in the um, original staff report. There was a, uh, looked like a redacted um, set of numbers in a table. This is in regard to the uh, housing element implementation report, item number seven. Um, we didn't mean to, to, to redact it. It's just kind of not applicable the way the columns lined up. But we did uh, add that in total, um, we do actually exceed our arena numbers, as you can tell. And uh, we have met um, our obligation through 2023 with a total of um, 800 and... Um, almost 860 units. So wanted to bring that to your attention. Also on item number eight, uh, which is the public hearing item and the undergrounding uh, for rule 20, um, there's just a typo under the establishment of undergrounding utilities district that the March 10th, 2020 public hearing, which was also advertised in the San Mateo County Times is incorrect. And that uh, those are the only changes. So moving on to, uh, City manager report, uh, real quick, starting March 12th, uh, Census 2020 will be underway. Um, there'll be information that's sent out by the U.S. Census Bureau to um, everyone living within the county to participate in filling out the uh, quick census 
survey, either online, by mail, or over the phone. So please look that up, and that will go through uh, the, the, the first part of April. So um, there's been a lot of uh, communication from the city and the school district and the county, city of California, nationally, about making sure um, that everyone is counted. It's very, very important. Any information by law um, cannot be used for any other purpose but for counting the census. So we're encouraging everyone to make sure it's counted. There are fiscal um, impacts associated with uh, our citizens and everyone being counted in terms of grant funding and allocation of federal and state funding, so extremely important. We also have information uh, on the city's website regarding that. Now I'd like to bring to your attention a um, some, some comments on something that's on everybody's mind, and that's COVID-19. Um, we've been very um, diligent as a city in monitoring CDC, having communications with the county health officer, um, the school district, um, police and fire department, as well as other cities uh, within the area. Um, the city of Millbrae is following the protocol as outlined by a Center for Disease Control, CDC, and the county health officer, which is, um, I think everyone knows, is to uh, avoid close contact with anyone that's sick. If you are sick, please stay home, um, see your uh, personal physician, or reach out to the county medical clinic, which is in the uh, city of San Mateo. Avoid touching your face, particularly your eyes, nose, nose and mouth. Um, Cover your nose and mouth when you cough and sneeze. Clean and disinfect surfaces and objects that may uh, be contaminated with germs. Tonight, you can see that we've got uh, our, our hand sanitizer, which C CDC recommends that, and Clorox-type products uh, for cleaning. And then, again, um, going to our website, our homepage, Elaine can go through it. We have uh, a letter from the mayor um, just kind of indicating uh, the, the status of everything and information for all of our citizens uh, that can log on. There's a video uh, from the county. There's also um, protocols to stay healthy. And if you are feeling ill, um, steps to take uh, in that regard. I'd also like to um, mentioned Marion Kwong is in the office tonight. I've reached out to Marion. She's volunteered to be our interpreter this evening, so I'd like to recognize Marion. Marion has been a tremendous help in translating a lot of the information that we've sent out over the last uh, uh, couple of days, last week, um, so we're, we're able to get to um, everyone in our community the information. So I'd, I'd really like to thank Marion for all the great work and efforts and volunteerism. So thank you, Marion. The citizen that's really stepped up, so um, she's here tonight to help and assist with any uh, needs for um, any translation. Um, so, uh, you know, every uh, I've spent about six hours on this uh, item today because it seems like every hour um, things start to change. And so we're going to continue to monitor the situation um, and things could be changing, you know, really on a daily basis. So all the citizens make sure that you um, contact um, through via our website or the county information line, which is just simply 211. Um, that is uh, accessible to county medical officer and the EOC that the county um, has set up uh, during, uh, during this time. Um, Also, um, just this evening, real quick, um, knowing that some of the protocol, if, if people are comfortable social distancing up to six feet, um, we've set up a temporary comment uh, line for people to participate remotely uh, for tonight's meeting and may continue this uh, process through, um, through the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, but anyone that um, would like to participate on any item in the meeting, they can simply email us at Millbrae Council Meeting at ci.milbray.ca.us, um, and we have, I think, uh, five or six. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Roman, if it's council meetings, plural, correct? Because there was a it is communication earlier today. Meetings. Thank you. Council meetings. Yes. Milbray council meetings at ci.milbray.ca.us, and this is also on our website. And we do have everything translated um, for uh, Chinese, Spanish, and, and English. So
So with that, uh, moving on, we do have um, several events that are coming up that we will continue to monitor and, and, and by the end of the week make a decision on whether we continue to proceed or not. But with that, we do have a Millbrae Fix-It Clinic on March 21st. Um, this is uh, at the library. Coaches will be in attendance to troubleshoot and uh, help uh, people fix their broken household items such as electronics, appliances, computer toys, bicycles, and fabric items. That Fix-It Clinic will start at noon in the Millbrae Library. Um, and you can also register by either our website or contacting 888-442- Two six six six. Also, the Millbrae Art Show contest is is continuing to move forward and being planned until further notice. So, if anyone is interested in entering um, any of their art or creations into the Millbrae Art Show, uh, the Millbrae Cultural Arts Advisor Committee is encouraging submittals. And to submit an art entry, you can visit also the city's website or uh, visit. Um, um, physically over at the Recreation Center for an entry form. Uh, the last day to submit entries is Friday, March 20th. So moving on to the agenda, um, after the uh, city manager's report, uh, we have item number two, which is the calendar of events, reports of bills and claims, uh, report out uh, by the city attorney of um, this evening's earlier closed session. Uh, then we move on to item number three, approval of the meeting minutes for the regular, regular meeting of February 25th. There are no oral reports this evening from any uh, city committee or commission items. Following that item, that's when we do have public communication, and that's where any citizen can speak to the city council for three minutes on any item not on the agenda this evening. Then we move to the consent calendar. We have... Uh, Three items on the consent calendar, starting with item number five. That's a review of the quarterly investment schedule for the second quarter of fiscal year 2019-20. Item number six is approval of a street closure on the 300 block of Broadway uh, for our 2020 Beats and Brews and uh, Broadway music series. Item number seven is the housing element progress report update for 2019. Then item number eight is a public hearing item. Uh, this is a, a recommendation to adopt a resolution establishing an underground utilities district in the city of Millbury between Magnolia and Minorca Way. Under existing business, there are no existing business items, but we do have several new business items. Item number nine is to designate a funding agreement between the Millbury Recreation Center and the Millbury Community Foundation. Item 10 is to consider approval of an ordinance regarding the safe storage of firearms in residential uh, units. Item number 11 is to accept the fiscal year 2019-20 mid-year budget report. Item number 12 is to consider the establishment of a citywide parking authority to oversee, manage, and operate and acquire and potentially finance public uh, parking facilities. That's an information item. Item number 13 is an informational report on minimum wage and wage theft. After that, we move to council comments and adjournment. So if there are no questions on the agenda, Ms. Mayor. Sorry, Mr. Mills. Um, going back to the um, uh, announcements regarding uh, coronavirus, um, is there anybody here from the school district? Because uh, I believe they were invited to make some comments about what the plans are and the response is at the schools. Yes, Ms. Mayor, we did. Uh, we did invite the school district. We received confirmation that they would be in, a, in attendance earlier today. But just right before the meeting, um, I received a, a message that they will not be here okay. tonight. Um, okay, fair enough. But maybe tomorrow, can you follow up with them and see if we can get information out as uh, as quickly as possible? As I know there are concerns. Um, yes. Regarding a student at Taylor Middle School who may have been exposed. Yeah, Mayor, we also reached out um, to try to schedule a meeting with uh, the subcommittee of the city council and subcommittee of the full school board, um, the, the um, quarterly meeting, uh, to get together in light of the coronavirus and have that discussion. So that um, meeting is uh, being scheduled. It's good to schedule the meeting, but it's probably more urgent to get the information out as, as soon as possible. So let's Correct. try to follow up. Uh, to and I, I guess on that, I'd like to be, yeah clear that, again, the city um, is following all the protocols and getting information out. So Correct. And the city has no authority to close uh, schools, public or private schools. That is correct. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Councilman Lee? Oh, so um, we're not going to make any decisions here, but just for the public, um, what is, I think they'd like to be reassured that the city is on top of this, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm reassuring everybody in the city that we are. 
uh, monitoring this daily. We have one o'clock uh, calls for the county, um, and uh, we are trying to make determinations based on information from the county uh, of what are the prudent steps to, to take. And the reason is that, uh, that something like this, closing services and buildings and things has a, a long, um, long effects that affects many, many people. Um, so we don't want to make decisions just on fear and, um, and subjective uh, thinking. We want to make sure everything's done objectively um, and that it, it, it doesn't cause um, uh, uh, unintended consequences. And just to read a quote from the uh, county health, uh, um, head of the county health, uh, he, he at this time doesn't think that uh, it's a good idea to, um, he says that there is uh, evidence of uh, uh, spreading as we already know, um, but he's also rec not recommend that we, uh, everybody uh, uh, quarantines uh, because he thinks that's gonna uh, really hurt uh, our communities much more than the, than, than, uh, than, uh, the benefits would, would be not as good. Um, so he's, he's recommending at this time um, that uh, we continue taking prudent steps um, and, and, uh, and, and, and keep watching. And we are monitoring every day. Um, and we're working with the school district to find out uh, what's, what's, uh, what's been happening. And we don't, have any, um, we don't have any authority to close the schools. Um, so people think that we, the city can just go and close the schools. We cannot. So uh, that's up to the school district. And uh, we are working with them to help them out and make sure they get the right information. Um, I understand that the uh, superintendent of the county is going to make an announcement tomorrow. Um, so uh, we will wait for that. And uh, I'm sure that the, I, I have confidence, my colleagues at the school district, that they're making the right, trying to make the right decisions and ensuring that there is no um, opportunity for contaminations or widespread breakout in uh, Millbrae. So I, I, uh, I ask that uh, we pay patient and that uh, we not let our fears take hold of us um, and that uh, we all have a vested interest in the safety of our city. Uh, we have children, we have family here, uh, and so we, we all are affected, and we don't, uh, we don't take this lightly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Yes. If I may, j just on that, um, there are no reported cases in the city of Millbrae, and as of right now on the website for the county, there's um, I think five reported cases right now countywide. Um, so again, we're continuing to monitor that, but I'd like to reiterate there are no cases that have been reported in the city of Millbrae. No confirmed cases. Correct. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Pappen, very quickly, and then yes. we need to move on. And the governor emphasized that every jurisdiction is different. So we are st carefully studying this. It's a very fluid situation, and everybody, it changes constantly. So we are on top of it as best we can. But just because one jurisdiction is doing something does not mean this jurisdiction does the same thing. So please bear with us, and everybody follow the instructions. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we also have a report out from the closed session. We have uh, Michael Conran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the council prior to this meeting met in closed session to discuss a workers' comp claim from a foreign, former employee, Don West. Uh, in that session, the council gave direction to their legal counsel. Okay, um, moving along, we have the approval of minutes uh, from the meeting of February 25th, 2020. Uh, we have a motion from Councilwoman Pappen and a second from Councilman Lee. Uh, your votes, please. <laughs> Gina? 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 The minutes passed unanimously. Okay, now uh, next on the agenda is public communication. This is the opportunity for any member of the public to speak on any item that is not on this evening's agenda. Um, if you'd like to speak, please fill out a speaker slip. We do have five um, emailed public comments that came in for our uh, special temporary email line. And our city clerk, Elena Suazo, will read them. And if you could please read uh, who the, the, the commenter for each one as well. The first comment is from Marge Colapietro. 
Honorable member and council members, as of this writing, there are no confirmed cases of COVID-19 within Millbrae and four confirmed in San Mateo County with no fatalities. We must remain and practice due diligence at all times relative to our community members, working staff, and emergency responders. Please review upcoming scheduled meetings and events for the public, for our city commissions, committees, and civic groups. Also work with our downtown businesses so that they will know and take appropriate steps to stay open and not run the risk of closures. You may wish to contact San Mateo County Health Department and request that all businesses in Millbrae receive safety guidelines and practices during this horrific and dangerous time. I also call your attention to those age 50, 60, and older, especially the Senior Advisory Committee, Senior Programs, and the Self-Help for the Elderly Meal Program that takes place three times a week in the David J. Chikuti Community Room. My request is Mayor and Council give some thought to assign City Manager Williams to dedicate a specific person solely for the day-to-day -day upkeep and public communications. We need to think of the good of the whole in our community, focus on knowledge and prevention, and ensure we have enough vital and emergency protective test equipment and supplies in time of need. Thank you for your consideration. Marge Cola Pietro, Mayor Emeritus, City of Millbrae, Community Advocate and Volunteer. The second comment is from Wen Yu. Hi. Is it possible for the schools to offer flexible learning plans? Currently, absence is still counted, and schools are large gatherings of people with high risk for virus spread. For families who can keep their kids at home, it will be useful if the home learning option is provided to reduce the risk for kids who have to go to school because parents have to work. Thank you, when you. The third comment is from Sean Peng. Questions for school district superintendent and city council. Number one, full account of what happened from superintendent. Number two, assessment of exposure. Which class was the student with exposure in? Which students were in same room or group activities with that student? How many days of exposure? We do not need the contact student name, but need these other information. Number three, what's the plan to quarantine those students who had exposure to the contact student? So far, this is not done. Why let us take the risks of COVID-19 spread? Number four, if you only learned about it Sunday night, how can you effectively disinfect the whole school? What sanitation team was hired? What's the time spent and procedure for disinfecting? What's the sanitation company's credentials? Number five, can superintendent provide full information to school staff, parents, and city council so we are all educated to make informed decision? From what we know, the school staff knows even much less than parents, and that's not right. Their health is equally important. Number six, can superintendent initiate the steps of tailored teaching online before everything is confirmed or move spring break up? Number seven, can school district request the state's permission to not record the student's leave due to COVID-19 concern as absence? Can school district make its own decision on this without state approval? Many other schools already excuse students on this absence. Number eight, 
Can both parties work with Millbrae hospitals on clear procedure on how parents could work with doctor to order the COVID-19 test if they are concerned about the exposure? Mills Hospital staff is unsure how the test can be ordered. Thanks for your efforts in keeping our schools and communities safe. Sean Peng, CFA slash CPA. And the last comment is from Daphne Gu. Dear Sir, Madam, I understand you are meeting tonight to discuss coronavirus impact. As a concert parent, I would like to ask the school district to consider allow students homeschooling without being counted as absent. The recent cases suggest children are as easy to be infectious as adults. They might have no symptom and easy to recover, but infected children are as contagious as adults. As a family with senior residents with underlining health conditions, I am deeply worried. I think if you open the options to allow students study at home for a few weeks, it will help prevent the virus getting spread and make families with elder residents much safer. Thank you for your consideration. Best regards, Heng. And that was the last comment. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Wazo. And uh, I know we cannot really comment on public comments, but the, as, at least for the, the comments that were specific to the uh, school district concerns, perhaps we can forward those along to um, the superintendent as well um, for tomorrow morning. Okay. Uh, Councilman Lee, we need to move. Uh, I just uh, give people a quick update that uh, if you um, if you feel that uh, you are you are exposed to uh, coronavirus and you want to have a test, you need to contact your primary physician um, and make arrangements to visit them so they can prepare to to receive you. Um, they will uh, they will uh, do a preliminary diagnosis, and then they will re uh, refer you or give you the te or test you. Um, and that's what the county has uh, set up. So uh, right now there is no, air, no particular place you can go to get tested. Um, so you need to contact your primary physician. Okay, um, seeing no other public comments, uh, public comment is closed. Um, so let's move on to the consent calendar. We have items five, six, and seven. Um, let me clear the board, please. All right, so we have a uh, motion from Vice Mayor Schneider and a second from myself. Uh, your votes, please. Items number five, six, and seven on the consent calendar passed unanimously. Okay, um, I know we have uh, several members in the audience tonight here. It looks like are here to speak on item 10. Um, and we have a couple of public comments that came in as well. So perhaps we can take that one next. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do we have a presentation? Uh, yes, just, just some uh, quick comments, uh, Mr. Ramers of the City Council. Um, so this item is to consider uh, an ordinance adding a new chapter 5.130 of the City of Millbury Municipal Code entitled Safe Storage of Firearms in Residences. Uh, as part of the 2019-20 adopted City Council goals, staff is bringing forth this proposed ordinance modeled after San Mateo County's ordinance requiring safe storage of firearms in residences. In addition to the City Council directed preparation of the subject ordinance, the City's been approached by several Millbury residents and their affiliated group Moms Demand Action requesting such an ordinance to be adopted. Uh, we've worked uh, with uh, members of that group to help us develop the ordinance, especially as it relates to the um, to the penalties that are associated um, in vi any violation of the ordinance. Um, so the safe storage of gun ordinance, as I mentioned, is similar to the ordinance adopted by San Mateo County. It was approved by the County Board of Supervisors in March of 2019. Several other cities, including Burlingame, South San Francisco, San Mateo, Redwood City, and others throughout not only San Mateo County, but the region have adopted similar ordinances. Um, as it stated in the staff report, um, this particular ordinance has been tested uh, in the Ninth uh, Circuit. Um, as compliant with um, with all federal rules and regulations and, and constitutionally um, valid. 
Um, Mike Connoran and his team have worked closely with us as well uh, to craft the ordinance and do all the legal review. So in the proposed gun storage ordinance itself, um, it simply requires that weapons or guns in, in residences be stored safely uh, in a locked uh, container or there's a trigger lock um, that is required. Um, the difference between the city of Millbrae proposed ordinance and the county is, is uh, any violation would be a civil assessment uh, rather than a misdemeanor uh, offense. Uh, the civil assessment that's proposed, uh, the first violation would be $250. Uh, the second violation within that same year would be 500 and a third violation within that same one year would be $1,000. So it's a civil penalty uh, versus a criminal penalty. And this, again, working with Moms Demand Action uh, and their experience in, in assisting cities uh, in such ordinance felt that this is a more appropriate type of um, um, penalty uh, and it's uh, equitable um, throughout the um, uh, the, the population and, and the community. Um, so I'd like to uh, further just note um, for the record that firearm injuries do cause significant public health impacts. Uh, it's proven that a loaded or unlocked gun in the home can increase the risk of gun-related injury and death. And according to reports published in 2008 in the New England Journal of Medicine, living in a home where guns are kept increasing the individual's risk of death by homicide by between 40% to 170%. Similarly, in 2004, a national study determined that the presence of guns in homes increased an individual's risk by death of homicide by 90%. So if adopted, the ordinance will be brought back to the city council on March 24th for a second reading and take effect 45 days later on May 8th, 2020. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that the city council has and as well as our city attorney. Okay, thank you, uh, city manager. Can you go back to what you were saying about the civil penalty versus a misdemeanor and why the civil penalty was uh, selected? Yeah, so in, in working, uh, again, with Moms Demand Action and doing a little bit of research, um, the, the penalty, the civil penalty um, is more in line with um, avoiding any discriminatory, discriminatory actions in enforcing such an ordinance, and that um, it, it's uh, more equitably allocated uh, if there is an offense. And do you think that two hundred and fifty dollars is enough of, of uh, a penalty? It kind of feels like a slap on the wrist to me. Well, I mean that that's a good question. So, um, in in researching this, um, some felt it was a little low. Some felt that it was appropriate. So we went with our recommendation um, at two fifty five hundred and one thousand within within one year. So. Um, you know, uh, under under um, general law, misdemeanor offense is six months in jail or a thousand dollars. So this is at the discretion of the city council. We could have the first penalty as high as a thousand dollars if if that would be desirous of the city council. Okay. I mean, I, yeah, I think to, I would be better to start higher, maybe five hundred as a, the first penalty, because you know, two hundred and fifty dollars. It's not going to pay for the you know, officer to write the ticket, right? That's, um, and to process it. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Happen. Yeah, I agree completely with the concept here, especially, particularly with some of the specifics. Um, I am concerned, uh, I like what the city of Burlingame did here. Um, this should not be probable cause to enter someone's home and I don't find that clarity in this ordinance. So by somebody saying, hey, I was in that house and it wasn't, their firearm was not secure, that should not be the probable cause for law enforcement to enter someone's home. Correct, and none of those rules are affected by this. So we would always have to follow in terms of search warrants or entry. I'm sorry, can, micro can you speak into the microphone, please? I'm sorry, but none of those rules are affected by this. So, so this is not seeking to make a change in terms of probable cause or search warrants or any of that. So this All those alone, things. somebody, you know, a neighbor says, hey, I saw this weapon in someone's home. We'd need to determine if that was probable cause, and we may have to go to court to get a search warrant. 
Well, I understand, though, that what Burlingame did was that is not the initial problem. You need more then that is a single probable cause to enter someone's home. I mean, if somebody has a warrant out or something, that's very, very different here. But if somebody has a family heirloom they inherited and, you know, this was the only thing, I, I find that exceptionally um, concerning. So I think that um, Burlingame put in some sort of a clarification that this alone could not be probable cause to get a search warrant. I'd like that checked out. Okay. We will. I'm not familiar with that. Could you elaborate because on that a little bit? I don't understand. Sure. I mean, okay, so, and I think a lot of people are in this situation where um, a family member inherits a weapon of some sort, and it could be an antique or something like that. It's displayed in such a way. It may be completely inoperable, but yet someone is in the home and says, hey, I saw this there, and that weapon was not secure. That should not be the only probable cause for law enforcement to go get a search warrant and enter someone's home. It has to be a secondary aspect to the reason for entering somebody's home. Maybe, I mean, if you maybe uh, we have the chief come up and give a comment about that. Good evening. Uh, as it goes to criminal probable cause to get a search warrant, and as far as I know in the state of California, it has to be a felony. So you don't get a civil one, we can't get a, a misdemeanor search warrant. I've authored hundreds of search warrants and it's always been for a felony. So I don't know that we'd be able to do that even if someone told us that. Uh, perhaps we could obtain a court order, but court orders don't typically allow you to enter and search. Thank you for the clarification. That makes sense then. So it doesn't need to be cleared up here? No, it wouldn't appear not. Uh, given the chief's representation, it would be clear that that I mean, would the not. the threshold for the standard of a search warrant, okay. a state search warrant in California. Anyway. Right. Thank you. Um, I'd still secondary point here. Not for you, chief. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I think we have situations here where people, because this ordinance is passed, people are going to have to expend money if they haven't already to secure their weapons, which they should be doing. Um, I don't think we want to really, we, we want to educate the public more than anything here so that we can have public safety and lower those numbers that were mentioned earlier here. Uh, I know also Burlingame's initial violation involved community service which could be related then to education overall here. I don't think escalating the fines to $1,000 or more or 500 is really getting the point across here. What we want to do is inform our public that there's an extreme danger by people having weapons within their homes. But I think the majority of people within our jurisdiction, they've, they either have them for various reasons, um, or they've inherited them in some way, shape, or form. And I don't think we want to really escalate this to a point. I think if we have, like, your initial evaluation is some sort of community-based service, then we can actually have them educating other people to the dangers um, that having a firearm within your residence would bring about. So I would disagree with the mayor on this. Uh, and and I wonder here, too, for clarification, why is it, I mean, you should have one violation, then say it's going to be the second violation, but they all have to be within one year? Um, That's typically what's done with administrative citations if they, they're usually within a year. So the, one year after the first one, then you'd start back at 250 under the current that's interesting. Um, I mean, hopefully nobody gets more than one violation, period. But um, it seems like, and is it then per weapon, or is it just um, single? It would be per offense, per occurrence right. of its three weapons, and I think there would be three administrative signs for each for each weapon. And then also, if I could clarify something, on the civil penalty also, as I understand it, there is no criminal record, and that was one of the other things that was brought to our attention, that on something like this, 
um, because there's also state law that, that also governs this, um, that if there was a violation, it is about education. It's not about necessarily about somebody having a criminal record um, violating the safe storage ordinance locally. If you have so a criminal wonder, record, you shouldn't have a weapon. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that so if, if you're caught with this, instead of having a misdemeanor on your record, it's an administrative violation of the municipal code because we're also protected by state law, right. um, which can be up to a felony. And when does this take effect? How, um, how long do people have to comply with this? Because again, I think we have several residents within this jurisdiction who will need education and time to comply with this. It doesn't seem to say. Yes, sir. Ordinances are normally effective 30 days after adoption. The staff report I actually had a mistake in it that we had tried to correct. I mean, typically an ordinance is effective 30 days after adoption. If the council wishes to, you could put it longer. So you could give a period of time, a, a grace period for people to get familiar with it. I would note, as, as the city manager has mentioned, there already is state law on this. It's, it's written in a slightly different approach in terms of it, it's more aimed at what happens with the weapon. So if you have a weapon and that ends up injuring someone, the penalties are much more severe. I, I think this is a different approach, which is simply to try to uh, uh, cajole people in the community to follow safe gun practices. Uh, and you know, again, not the. I think cool. the state has taken care of, and the state and the local district attorney have the prosec you know, prosecutorial uh, power to do that. I think this is more a uh, it's just a community effort to encourage people to follow good practice. Along those lines, because I do believe this council is of the consensus that we should have something like this here. How are we going to educate our public? Can we have something on the website as to how they? can secure their weapons and where you find those um, items or materials and what actually qualifies. Yes, yeah, so if the council adopts the first reading this evening, then we will work on information. There's an FAQ um, in, in looking at the county and other city ordinances that we will um, that we will follow and, and do outreach to educate the community on gun, lo on, on, um, gun locks as well as um, storage boxes. Yep. Okay. I just point out there's one, I mean, it, it's in the ordinance, but um, a pretty important factor is that this, the Department of Justice of the state has a list for each type of weapon, what are the acceptable locks that are appropriate for that particular weapon. So I think a link to that website would be something that would make a lot of sense to have on the city website. I'd say DOJ's website is not always that accessible or... <laughs> Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Schneider. That was, Gina actually got to my comment. On the city website, is it, because I didn't check, so we have information about this program, any additional gun safety laws. Can we, is it appropriate, to me it would be appropriate, to also include um, for people who might be contemplating suicide, not sure if they'd go to a website, but can we have information on there about both how to get rid of a gun, if you want to get rid of a gun, and uh, uh, links to where they can go to get help. And I'm sure there are a few other things we can do to make this a top-notch website. Okay. Uh, Councilman Lee? Uh, yeah, I just looked up uh, the price of a uh, gun safe, and the minimum price at Home Depot is one hundred two hundred six dollars. So, yeah, if, if uh, they should that, be doing that, it already, they, yeah, at least at least we're covering that. So, yeah, you know, I, I I agree that uh, I would only add I think you can get one here in Millbrae too at Millbrae Lock. And um, so my question is, well, I don't know what the price is at Millbrae Lock. <laughs> so, um, the the. Uh, um, I don't have a gun. <laughs> so, um, and the, and the um, so a question is, so a, a uh, building inspector goes in, for, look at the remodel or whatever they can, if they see that there's guns but not in the safe, they can report it? Is that, report is, that it. Is, is that an official observation? I think it would depend on whether or not we authorize them to issue a citation. Uh, so. But they can report it. They can report it. Sure. They, they could also issue an administrative citation if they see a violation. They're authorized, yeah. 
Sorry, did you say like a contractor or like a city building inspector? Building, like building inspector okay. goes in a house to inspect a remodeling, and they they notice there's guns lying around, and not not in safe. That's a good question. Okay, uh, Councilman Oliva. If I think the key here is the education, because we can have all the ordinances and the regulations in place that we want, whether it's state, local, whatever it is, but um, I think that. Council Member Papin and Vice Mayor uh, Schneider are in agreement to say that we can put this in place, but if we don't follow through on something for the cause and the effect, I mean, quite frankly, it's very similar to uh, anybody that has a swimming pool and you have ordinances that say you have to have locked gates and such. I mean, it's danger. There's danger right in front of us. So if we don't get anything on our website or education or in the work with the schools on this, um, I think the best source of information for unlocked uh, guns is going to be the kids that live in the house whose parents have the guns that are not safe and in storage. So if we can get the kids to help um, know that it's not okay, know that it is unsafe, um, that's going to be the key, the education. Okay. Um, let's, we have a couple of speaker slips on this. Just really quick. A very quick comment, um, Ms. Mayor. My ex had, quote, unquote, classic or an inoperable guns, and um, I'd love to see something on the website that says, how does one treat inoperable guns? Because to me, they can become operable. So let's make sure we've got information about that, too. Okay, we have a couple of speaker slips and I believe a couple others that have emailed in. So let's start with um, Jen Sari with Moms uh, Demand Action. Either one. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jen Sar, and I'm a resident of Millbury, as well as a volunteer for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Moms Demand Action is a nonpartisan grassroots organization that's made up of both non-gun owners and gun owners. Our mission is to reduce gun violence and improve gun safety for everyone. We believe that the Second Amendment can be respected while at the same time better protecting people through common sense gun legislation. We want to thank this council for considering the adoption of a safe storage ordinance, which would require all firearms in a home to be securely stored in a locked container or disabled with a trigger lock. One small child dies almost every day in this country after finding an unsecured firearm in their own home, a relative's home, or while playing at a friend's house. In addition, two older children, particularly teens, die every day in this country by suicide from an unsecured firearm they obtain from their home or another home. 80% of school mass shootings are done by current or former students using an unsecured firearm that they found in their own home or a relative or friend's home. Research shows that keeping guns securely stored does not hinder self-protection. A gun can be accessed within seconds, but it does prevent unintentional deaths of children and teen suicides by as much as 85%, depending on the type of storage. Finally, storing firearms in a securely locked container also keeps guns from being stolen in a home robbery. Um, in, the, in California, cable locks are given for free with all gun sales. Um, there are locked containers you can find for as low as $35. Obviously, they go up in price, um, and many police departments will give out trigger locks for free. There is a California penal code which partially addresses this issue, but it only applies to homes with children and it only penalizes after the firearm has injured or killed victims. There needs to be a law in place that keeps everyone safe from firearms before a tragedy happens. The safe storage ordinance is such a law. There are many cities and towns in California that have already adopted the safe storage and many of them were mentioned earlier, including Burlingame, Redwood City, Foster City, San Carlos, and on and on and on. Many of the towns that do not have them in place are in the process of discussing it much like Milbrae is. When considering the penalty for violating the safe storage ordinance, Moms Demand Action strongly supports the civil penalty rather than the criminal penalty. We suggest the fine or community service, and this is because we feel that people of color may be disproportionately affected by this law, and we don't think that the criminal penalty is necessary. We feel that having the ordinance on the books will ultimately help to change our culture, much like the seatbelt laws have done. Most firearm owners are law-abiding and will follow the law if it's in place, and they are aware of it. Of course, no law is ever going to be 100% followed, and there does need to be a penalty if it is not, but we support the civil penalty. Um, the towns that adopted the safe storage ordinance early on in the process did make it a criminal penalty, but the more recent towns that have done it have made it the civil penalty. And we really thank you for considering that civil penalty. 
thank you again for working on this and we're happy to help um, in any way going forward and we thank you for your time okay thank you all right uh, the uh, next speaker is Vince Musi welcome back <clears throat> Vince Musi uh, Hillsboro. Um, I have a, a rifle that I bought in 1964. It's a single shot rifle. I don't have any bullets for it. Uh, and I, I heard what a councilman Pappen said about collectors. <clears throat> the odd thing is if you're a collector of a gun, you want to display it. And having a lock on it ruins the display. If there's no, if, if there's no, uh, if you I think just two elements here. You have to have a gun and you have to have a bullet. If there are no bullets, I, I understand it could be stolen and I, I hadn't thought about that. That is an issue. But having a lock on it, if the gun's stolen, locks can be removed. So I, I just, I, I, I think you need to consider two things, the, the gun and whether there are any bullets. If there are no bullets, I mean, if you have an old gun that has no bullets, what's the danger? You're going to hit somebody over the head with a gun. I don't know. That's my, my comment. All right. Thank you, Mr. Musi. Um, and uh, Mayor, just to respond to that. Um, yes. So the, the ordinance references a statute in the California Penal Code that determines, uh, defines the word firearm. Uh, and I note that it has an exception from that definition for what's called an unloaded antique firearm. Uh, it doesn't go into more specifics about the definition of the word antique. We can we can look into that. But I think it, it at least goes part of the way towards what Mr. Boozy was, was suggesting. So those would be excluded already under our terms. Um, if you would like more specificity is what the definition of antique is, we can we can see if that's there. Yeah. Okay, and um, City Clerk, I believe we have a couple of uh, emails that were sent in on this item. Yes. Okay, thank you. The first comment is from Marge Cola Pietro, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. <clears throat> I clearly recall attending your goal setting special session on Saturday, April 13, 2019, when I requested Council to consider establishing stronger gun laws in our city. Each of you concurred and agreed to include the issue to your 2019-2020 goal priority list. I'm hoping that each of you kept your freedom from gun violence badges in clear view as a reminder to accomplish your goal within the fiscal year. Here we are only 10 months and 28 days later with an action to add a new chapter to our municipal code for safe storage of firearms in residences. I hope that our community members take the time to read the staff report that includes the new ordinance. One section that I found to be quite stunning is the one relative to those persons 24 years old and younger. I thank all of those who worked for many hours, just short of an entire year, to assist council to fulfill your noble goal with this ordinance. I request you take action as recommended by staff. Thank you for keeping your promise to continue to help keep Melbray safer. Thank you for your consideration. Marge Cola Pietro, Mayor Emeritus, City of Milbrae, Community Advocate and Volunteer. The second comment is from Robert Gottschalk. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I am Robert Gottschalk and I live at 10 Milbrae Circle. I realize I am walking against a strong current, but here are my views on the ordinance for storage of firearms. If you have rifles or shotguns used for hunting, skeet shooting, or target practice, by all means, lock them in a safe. These are not likely needed in an emergency. Fire department response in Melbray is slightly under four minutes. I will assume the sheriff response times are similar. Very terrible and tragic action can take place in four minutes. Envision a person or two breaking in the door at two or three o'clock in the morning, entering with weapons and with the intent to threaten or violently attack the resident to force him or her to give up their money or valuables. 
This is a so-called home invasion robbery. There will be only a few seconds in which to prepare to defend oneself. I cannot fumble in the dark for some keys and move into another room to unlock a gun safe in time to defend myself. It is meaningless to suggest that. I cannot fumble in the dark looking for keys in hopes I can unlock a trigger lock in time to do me any good. It cannot be said as did the Ninth Circuit, that the measures were only minimally burdensome on gun owners' ability to ex access their firearms for self-defense purposes. The Ninth Circuit is known for their often non nonsensical decisions and often reversed. If I am prevented by the ordinance or by other law to access my firearm in a matter of only a few seconds as necessary for the defense of my life or my person, the practical effect is the same as prohibiting me from ownership at all. The state exceptions, number one, that a firearm was used in lawful self-defense, and number two, that the person had a reasonable expectation that no child would be on the premises makes sense are practical and need to be included as exceptions in the Milbrae Ordinance. Thank you for your time and consideration. Robert G. Gottschalk. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Suazo, for reading those. Okay, um, so uh, how does the council wish to proceed from here? Um, I, I, I think we're of common mind here that we need to move ahead with something like this. I would like, though, um, to consider the um, public service for the first violation because we do have residents here that we need to educate. Um, if they have multiple weapons, you're already up to $1,000. Um, and I, I just think that becomes too harsh. I do appreciate all the moms for being here, and we're going to look for your help as we progress here. Um, but I think we should make the first penalty um, just a public service um, sort based and then move on from there because I think that achieves the goal that we want to achieve here um, by really educating our public, giving them the opportunity to secure their weapons moving forward and hopefully ensure safety all around. So that would be an amendment I would suggest. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Uh, if I may, um, jump in here real quick. So based on the last speaker's comments, um, on page three of five, there's a table that we do have exceptions in the ordinance. One is uh, if the firearm is physically carried on the person, or if the firearm is within close pr enough proximity and control of the person who is legally allowed to possess the firearm that the person can readily retrieve and use the firearm as if carried on the person. So I think that that would take care of Mr. Gottschalk's comments um, and address his, uh, his issues. Okay. I wanted to note that uh, and, for the record to the council. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Holmes. And um, Councilwoman Pappen, do you have a, a suggested amount of community yeah. service that would be acceptable to you? Are the moms aware of what Burlingame did as far as the public service um, at this point? In Could you come to the microphone and help us, please? I really appreciate that. Thank you. So they had a, um, a fine up to $1,000 or community service. And so oh, the, an the or. two other towns, yeah, or, ah, yeah, interesting. or. Interesting, okay. Um, and so, you know, presumably if somebody maybe had financial issues, they could choose the community service. Um, I see, okay. That, um, if we could, I, I, I like the or because again, we, some people may not be able to afford this at all, but we want to achieve the goal. Sure, and the goal is really education. It's really changing right. the culture. Um, I, I think um, the, the issue though with the home invasion, we are not anti-Second Amendment. We, we definitely want people to be able to feel that they can do that, but I will say, that um, you can get a lock container and you can bolt it to your bed if you want or your nightstand. Uh, it is a lock container. You can have a padlock that is lit in the dark so that you can, it takes seconds. And I've, 
I've gone shopping for them. It, okay. it, it takes seconds. So he would be able to defend himself. Um, no question. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, I do like the or, so we can actually find out what a good um, public service alternative would be um, and then keep the fines as addressed here. So you could, for your first offense, um, either be fined or take the public service aspect of it. I think that achieves both of, of what we were looking to do here. Um, and I do think it's very important that we educate the public on our website, as Councilmember Schneider said, I think the suicide numbers and all of that, everything needs to be included to really be impactful, and I would suggest that as well. So if we could, I don't know what Burlingame did, but if we could start with that as an amendment moving forward or the penalty, because again, if somebody inherited three rifles or something, they're already up to close to $1,000 anyway, and I... I would prefer not to penalize our residents, but just to educate them moving forward. So for the first violation? It would be you, the 220 or whatever it is here. 250 um, or? 250 Mayor or. 500, so. um, I, I would try I not to do some, that. I saw some nods that seemed to be in agreement with uh, the um, community service. I, I think if we do that, we would need to stipulate it in the ordinance. And I don't yeah. know what you think is appropriate, six hours, eight hours? Um, I probably s six hours. Six hours community service or yeah. two hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. Um, and again, that's per violation. So people, I, we need to be very clear here. I don't, I don't think that was clear. That's going to be per weapon. I, personally, I think I would prefer to take this back, look at what Burlingame did, and come back to you with some language to address that. Yeah, I think some jurisdictional consistency might be helpful, but they went to 1,000 right away, and I'm not willing to do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Would that be the second reading then, or no, it would have to be a first reading again? Okay. So um, then I guess there's no action to take then, if, assuming there's comments. concurrence, right? What we want to do is get them all and get them in now so that when we bring okay. them back to you with something, you're going to be able to act on. I'm, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think one of the most important aspects of this is that if your gun or weapon is stolen and you didn't have it locked, okay, we don't want to penalize. We want you to report that weapon lost here. And I think this, your, this ordinance really does that, encourages people that, hey, you know, that you need to report any weapon that's stolen because those are the ones that are used mostly in crimes. So we're not penalizing or deterring people from that. And I think that's what's important in this ordinance. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor Schneider. I, I think what I heard the mom's demand action was largely targeted at children, but do you have additional advice for guns that could be used in spousal abuse? There are laws against that. I, I understand that there are laws against that, but I can tell you from family experience of people who tried to call the police department to come in and look at guns and what happened to those guns, um, even when there were restraining orders involved. So it's not always so clear cut as that. Um, maybe that's time for a different ordinance or better education or, um, you know, I couldn't even tell you where the close, well, we're not supposed to know where battered women's shelters are, but what the current process is if you're a battered woman, because they are just, or a battered man, um, or a battered, uh, um, I don't know the the correct term, um, a place for them to go to get assistance um, in that situation, but I have familiar experience with that. And for... Yeah. yeah, exactly. So if there's a restraining order at all, the law enforcement goes out right away and takes the weapons. There's no questions asked. You cannot have one. Okay. I'd like to see that on the website, too, then. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Oliva, and then let's move on to the next one. So item. the policy is great, and I'll support all the different amendments to it, and I thank you very much for bringing it to the forefront. Um, but just a month ago, in South San Francisco, there was a suicide because somebody was... A very dear friend to me too and he was a very young man that that shot himself 
very, very in a lot of trouble. And it had nothing to do with anybody being able to report an unlocked gun. So we can take this forward and we can have another policy in place, but unless we educate the people with something that goes after this policy in place, and I say it again, that if somebody was in his home and noticed that there was an unlocked gun and was able to report it without having to put a penalty on it on somebody that was troubled, it would have maybe saved a life. So the education, I'm okay with any of the amendments and you can call six hours of a community service, you can call $1,000 or $250, but if we don't educate our young people and our families to what could happen if we don't take care of people that are under stress with a gun around, then it's useless. And we do have, you know, buyback uh, programs um, that, uh, that come up pretty frequently in this county. So um, I think it would be good to, to promote those the next time a, a buyback program if anybody wants to give up an unwanted, um, unneeded weapon. Um, We've just, supported but, uh, twice. We have, yes. But the buyback programs have always been, one was down in Redwood City and I think the other was in Daly City. And maybe the, the need is greater up there, but I would like to see the county move those buyback programs close. I, I mean, I don't know, if you really want to get rid of your gun driving to Redwood City, it's probably not a big deal, but if you don't have a car, maybe it is a big deal. Okay. So they should be moving these buyback programs around and not just in uh, certain parts of the county. Okay, um, so I think we have um, direction to um, amend the ordinance to include a community service option on the first amendment, on the first violation. Um, so let's bring that back at the next meeting and uh, move on to, um, uh, let's see, I'd kind of like to do the items where we have public comments. Um, I see we have a couple uh, comments for item nine. So maybe we can don't, do. Don't we vote for uh, for first waving? No, because it has to come back for first uh, we reading. Could, well, so we, we've in the past just wait, did, just did the vote and then had it amended for the next next uh, reading. Or agreement on on the um, additions to the ordinance. So just even a concurrence that um, we will include a fine or uh, community service. Um, there's a couple other changes I'd like to make. Uh, yep. if, if you want to have city staff, ex, if you want to have city staff uh, uh, issue citations, we're going to need to put that in the first. We're going to need to add that. So I, th I think we have some changes to make. So I, I, I think we should bring it back. Okay. Okay. Should, should we list those to make sure that um, at least a majority of the council is in concurrence with yeah. the changes so then we, there's no confusion when we bring it back? Okay. So the first is, is, is either the fine or community service, and we'll make a determination on what the appropriate amount is based on um, other cities within, within the area. And then Mike. All right. Um, I'm, I'm just looking in terms of the things I heard. Uh, I want to look at the, uh, each gun is a, is a separate violation language. I want to make sure that's clear. Um, is it the consensus that you want that or? Yes. So, Okay, um, and then uh, let's see. Um, uh, also, just looking at—I mean, I know Con uh, Council Member Pappen raised the question of search warrants. I think I'd like to look a little bit further. There are administrative search warrants that are used in code enforcement cases. I haven't done one for ever, but there may be some ways. But I'd maybe like to look at that a little more and just give you some additional information on that. Um, and then uh, uh, in, in line with the public comment, uh, just uh, I'd like a little more in the definition of antique guns and collector guns and how those are addressed, because uh, that doesn't seem, I'm not sure that's been fully vetted, so. Some of us think we are ourselves antiques, so um, <laughs> it'd be interesting to find the definition. <laughs> Let's move. Let's move on. Um, do, we need, do we need clarification of what inoperable means? I'd like to get that clear. I mean, there's antique here, but I didn't see inoperable in the yeah, definition. To me, inoperable is code. something else. Because yeah. I was told, oh, the firing pin was removed. Right. But how do non-gun people know that? Right. Well, so I, clarification would help. Yeah. Well, I think the main thing is we have to have the language in the law so that somebody can figure it out. And it's got to be, you know, understandable. Okay, uh, let's go on to item number nine, um, designated fund agreement for the Millbury Recreation Center between the Millbury Community Foundation and the City of Millbury. Sorry? Yeah, they're waiting. 
And we do have uh, several more items, so if we can keep our comments brief on each of these and try to move through them. Yes. Good morning, May. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, this is relating to the designated fund agreement between the Millbrae Community Foundation and the City of Millbrae for the Millbrae Recreation Center. As you all are aware, on July 16, 2016, a major structure fire destroyed the Millbrae Community Center, and right away the Millbrae Community Foundation set up a designated fund to bring in uh, donations that people were willing to give to help uh, rebuild the facility. And MCF has uh, raised nearly $70,000 in the fund. And moving forward shortly, the city will commence a fundraising campaign to help raise funds for ff &E. That is the furniture, fixture, and equipment in the new facility, as well as um, putting together a um, policy for naming rights for rooms within the new facility. Since the city is not considered a tax-exempt uh, organization, a partnership with MCF to collect these funds would help um, individuals or companies donating have an added benefit. So this might encourage individuals to, or individuals or organizations to donate more. And entering into this agreement will allow the city to move forward with an established funding, fundraising program and campaign and move forward with marketing and outreach as well to help bring in funds for, for the new recreation center. And as noted in the staff report, we recommend that city council approve the proposed designated fund agreement to move forward with this campaign. Any questions? Hey, thank you. Yes, uh, Vice Mayor Schneider. A couple of quick questions then. Um, I'm fully in support of this, and I thank the um, Millbrae Community Foundation for working with this. My questions are, if, if a group is giving funds, how would they specifically designate? And I know it's talked about in here, but would there be another layer of paperwork, or how would they know what they want to do, or that they're supporting what they want to support? Would you like to come up here? Well, I, uh, if I may, this so goes you, along with naming rights. So, if somebody specifically donates a hundred dollars and they say, "I want this to go to a tree or a bench or something specific within the recreation center," how do we know that that money is actually earmarked? Is that the question? I think it. it City manager and I had a discussion on this earlier today. The Millbrae Leo's board met on Sunday. They identified how much money they want to try to raise in the next couple of years. If they gave that money to the teen center, how would we know that it goes to the teen center? And then the city manager said, well, they could actually give that money directly to the city as opposed to MCF. So maybe we're talking more the private. If I'm United Airlines, United Airlines wants to donate money that pays for the teen center, how would we know that that's specifically to the teen center? So we, we set this up to accommodate people who want to, for instance, uh, show up to another fun run and that money would be pooled and it would go into the furniture fixtures and equipment fund. Uh, it would be a small dollar value, but in the aggregate it could make a big difference. So for instance, uh, the Rotary Club has been holding $11,000 from the last fun run in anticipation that there would be a fund to put it into for the community center. So there would be that fund, which would be sort of the, you know, the spaghetti feed fund or, or the, you know, what, whatever, paver fund or however we decide to raise money. There would be a secondary fund, and that fund would be donor-directed, and it would have to be at a very high dollar level uh, in order to make it make any sense. So it couldn't be just you put 25 bucks in and you say, I want that bench named after me. We would have to come up with policies for how that would work. But uh, essentially with the donor directed fund, in order to qualify for the tax deduction, because this is a 501c3 we're talking about, there have to be certain uh, regulations within that for the donor to be able to say what they wanted the money to be used for. Otherwise, they're buying something, okay, and not going to get a tax write-off. So we, we have to uh, 
make sure that that's structured properly to comply with law. Then the third fund would be a sponsorship kind of fund, which is like the Leos could do, or United Airlines could do, or the Rotary Club could do, or Peninsula Chinese Business Association could do. Or if I wanted to donate my house, uh, and maybe I wanted to do a charitable remainder trust so that I donate my house uh, to MCF, uh, MCF sells the house, buys me an annuity, and uh, I get to live on that annuity, but I get the, the charitable deduction for it, and the remainder left after I die goes to the community center rebuild. All of those things could be accommodated in that, that third sponsorship fund. So essentially, we're trying to look at all the different ways we could serve the community to get the community center rebuilt, but also furnished, because it needs furniture, it needs drapes, it needs coffee pots, it needs computers, it needs workstations, it needs phone systems. So there are all sorts of things that can't be done with, for instance, just money to, to just build the structure. There's, there's also the possibility of expanding this to other phases of the rebuild. So for instance, Peninsula Healthcare District might want to contribute funds for a gymnasium or uh, some developer who's coming to town might want to have their name on uh, the uh, cafeteria portion or the kitchen portion, or the Lions Club might want to have its name on the, on the kitchen portion. Or these are, these are just ideas. So what we're trying to do with this contract is provide the vehicle to make it all happen. Great. Thank you. Quick question. Yes, uh, Councilwoman Pepin. So we had talked about a donor wall. Um, a yet, the, the, I guess it's these yet to be defined, the naming stuff and all. Is that going to go through the foundation or will that be done through the city? No, that, that would be done through the city. So we're working on, you know, once this agreement um, is, is approved and now that we're moving forward with reality, we all are also working on um, donor wall, um, what uh, what amounts will, so for example, get you a dedicated bench, a dedicated tree, get you naming rights to a room. So that will be forthcoming to the city council for review and approval shortly. And then it would still be run through the Education Foundation so they would still get the tax right. Not the Correct. Education mm -hmm. Foundation. Yeah. Don't confuse I'm sorry. Don't confuse Excuse me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's Millbrae yes. Community, Community Foundation. Foundation, which is different than Millbrae yes. Education Excuse Foundation. Me. Thank you for bringing that up because yeah. we like people in the community to know that there are two different foundations. Correct. And we're proud of both of them. And, Thank you. And this one is not the one that's the Education Foundation. So once that's defined, it could be set up through this foundation. Correct. Then we'll coordinate and, and with the foundation and say, this, this, here's, here's kind of the shopping list for donations, Great. definitely. I, I just want to note, it is legally permissible to take a tax deduction on funds donated to a government entity, but there are those who may not wish to give their money directly to a governmental entity, would prefer to have a community uh, foundation control how that money is used. Um, and so this, this helps set up that arrangement. So if people want to have, for, you know, for different reasons, may have motivations where they'd rather have the foundation hold the money and control it. But uh, ultimately, you can give money to a government agency and get a tax deduction. Okay, let's move on to uh, public comment here. We have a couple speaker slips. Um, Janet, I don't know if you would have anything more to, to, to add. <laughs> well, I did want to, to speak to those, um, those different funds and to, to let the, the viewers know that this is an opportunity for you to be involved in making something really special happen in the city of Millbrae that will serve a lot of people. It will serve kids. It will serve seniors. It will serve everybody uh, who, who needs a place to go when we can once again go and socialize with each other. Uh, th our community center that, that burned down was that kind of special place. Uh, this will be an even bigger, better, um, more modern facility that has more resources and I think will be be very well used by by the people here in our community. And it's it's important for us to have that kind of community uh, a, a place, a, a place where we can all go 
uh, to, to do fun things with our friends, right? Um, I, I'd also like to um, suggest that uh, you might want to speak to our president of the Community Foundation, which is uh, Maureen, who I'm sure is, uh, has submitted a speaker slip. But I'd, I'd like to make one more point in that uh, this uh, designated fund agreement is very much based upon what we did with the Lion Scout House when we turned it into the Millbrae uh, Community Youth Center. So we use this same format. Uh, and in that, we were working with the school district and the city and the Lions Club. And what happened was we built a coalition of all kinds of community service entities here, uh, the Rotary Club, the Lion Club, the Millbrae Community Center uh, was, was uh, I'm sorry, the Millbrae Community Youth Center was rebuilt by a lot of people. You know, kids got involved, uh, local contractors got involved, uh, people donated uh, items, PCBA got involved, church groups got involved, uh, Rebuilding Together got involved. It, it really felt good that this was part that we all put our hands on and, and made it happen. And a community foundation, the Millbury Community Foundation wants to replicate that and, and make this community center restoration that same kind of ours. It's, it's ours. It's not just the cities. We are the city and it's going to be our our rebuilding project. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor Fogarty. Um, Maureen Davis. Hello, as Janet said, I'm Maureen Davis and I'm the president of the Community Foundation right now. Janet is also on the board of directors. Um, a lot's already been said, so I'm going to shorten the little notes I took here. Um, the Millbrook Community Foundation was founded many years ago and it, it was really founded to help the rec center back then. Over the years, we've expanded our interests, but we still have a focus on the rec center. As Mackenzie said, within days we were raising money after the fire for the fire um, for the community center. Skipping forward, what's nice about this agreement, as it's also been mentioned, but it's gonna be a safe place for these donations to land. And the process by which we give the money back to the community center or rec center is gonna be transparent and it's gonna be a formal process. So anybody who's worried about where the money went and how it got spent, you're gonna be able to see that completely. And as has been mentioned, the charitable deduction will hopefully encourage those people to give larger amounts of money. So we're grateful that the city sees us as a partner for this important task, and we hope that you will approve this agreement tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, Vice Mayor Schneider? I'm sorry, poor um, Mayor, I was trying to move this on. Um, just to let the public know, I'm an advisor to the Millbrae Leos Youth Club, and we did have this discussion just Sunday. So the target that they've set um, I don't want to do it yet because they still have to have their membership vote, but it's going to take them a couple of years to get to that. And the discussion that we had looking at their finances, is it better to give to MCF every year or to hang on to the funds themselves? Now, I'm not on the subcommittee for the rebuild of the rec center, so I'm asking the question now. You don't have to have an answer now unless you do, but um, those are the questions that at least this one youth group would like to know and their advisors, so we know how to tell the kids what to do. So the idea is that uh, this fund will also grow in interest. It will be invested in a safe investment, most likely a CD, and the funds that we raise will be pooled so that the CD will be that much larger, get you that much more interest on it. Now, if the Leos could do better on their own, they're, of course, welcome to do that, but we're anticipating that the funds won't be needed for a couple of years yet, particularly the FF&E. You've got to have the building before you can fill it. Uh, and so the idea would be that we could pool those funds and get a better return on them than if everybody holds onto their little pot and then Very good. drops it. Let's hopefully we'll make that really clear. Thank you. Um, All right, so we have, um, I don't know if the motion is for this item or if it was from the previous item. This, one. this item, okay. We have a motion from uh, Councilwoman Pappen and a second from Councilman Lee. Uh, your votes, please. Item number nine passed unanimously.
All right. Um, I said let's try to get to the ones that have speaker slips first. The only other speaker slip I have at this time is item 12. So can we go to that one next? Mm -hmm. I don't want to keep people late here. No, don't want to keep people later here than they need to be. Do you want Mike or that? So thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Again, Tom Williams, City Manager. I'll stand up here because we do have a little PowerPoint presentation. Um, this is a, uh, an information item on the establishment of a parking authority. What we wanted to do is just kind of explain what the assets are, what the uh, situation is with, with parking and parking management, or lack thereof comprehensively within the city, and what the establishment of a parking authority could do for us, and then get concurrence of the city council to move forward with this plan uh, to reach out to um, business owners and property owners, mostly within the downtown area, and, and then bring back a resolution uh, to establish a parking authority. So just, just in terms of background, um, as I mentioned, the city does have a large inventory of free public parking spaces in and around the downtown core, uh, as you know. We have received feedback from residents and, and business owners. Also, I have a couple of graphics of a survey that we did with the uh, Economic Vitality Advisory Commission that puts parking and parking management as one of their top issues that they've identified uh, for economic development in the downtown. Um, and then there's concerns about the unavailability of parking and the need Need to establish uh, more parking uh, in the downtown. And one of the ways to do that uh, is to uh, increase time limit parking and introduce parking meters. Uh, there is uh, evidence that time limit parking versus uh, that same parking space with a meter turns over 30 to 40 percent uh, more. So a very effective tool. So there are new planned and proposed development projects that will also generate uh, additional parking uh, beyond the parking that they supply on site. Um, th this will be visitor parking, um, parking for um, uh, just general daily uh, needs uh, and uh, buying power that would be associated with this new development and shopping within the downtown and the central core. Uh, Millbrae is one of the only or last remaining cities that does not have paid parking in its downtown in any city within uh, our region. Um, there's also p uh, potential to generate significant revenue, as I mentioned, from paid parking that can be used to work within parking improvements within the downtown core and permit residential permit parking programs uh, within the residential neighborhoods that are impacted with the spillover of parking demand from downtown within the residential neighborhoods. So as I mentioned, this is a um, uh, response from a questionnaire, and I just want to quickly go down to the, to the bottom, which the lack of parking uh, is one of the things we're identified by members of the Economic Vitality Advisory Commission as, as one of the things that they least like about downtown. And then that followed up with um, a listing of what they what they believe are the top priorities necessary to revitalize downtown. Uh, and that was, as you can see, um, 10 out of 10 on introducing parking meters or parking garages for additional parking and peripheral parking garages. So this is just a quick overview. Um, there are um, seven city owned parking spaces in the downtown, uh, starting with the one that is just east of the bar parking garage and west of Peter's Cafe. We've just called that Lot A. And then between uh, Victoria and La Cruz, uh, that's the parking lot that the uh, Farmer's Market uh, is held on. Parking Lot C extends a full block uh, between La Cruz and Hillcrest, uh, fronting Magnolia. Uh, then we also have the uh, parking lot um, by 7-Eleven, just to the north of 7-Eleven, it extends between El Camino and Broadway. And then moving further north, it's not on the map, we're calling that lots E and F. Uh, there's a parking lot next to the Millbrae furniture. And then uh, the parking lot that's actually within the area um, off of Park Boulevard. 
So these are just quick uh, overviews uh, to, to refresh your memory. There's 25 parking spaces uh, on the lot just uh, uh, east of Peter's Cafe. Um, the parking lot at Farmer's Market, there's 52 parking spaces. The large parking lot at Magnolia, there's 104 parking spaces. Then the uh, parking lot between Broadway and El Camino, um, just uh, north of Hillcrest, uh, 64 total parking spaces. This is the parking lot that I had mentioned. I, I didn't realize that this was a, a publicly owned parking lot. Um, this is over on off of Park Boulevard. There's 56 parking spaces. And then this is the 22 space parking lot that's just south of Millbrae Furniture. So what does all this mean? I, all in all, that's 323 parking spaces. If we value that right now at a market rate of 50,000 per parking space, that's $16.5 million in assets that the city currently owns. And th in addition to 300, or in addition to um, about 650 parking spaces, parking meter spaces within the downtown area. We, we achieve close to a thousand parking spaces that we provide today. And so, you know, the recommendation is to continue to work towards that and better manage that, those assets and better managing our, and better manage our parking inventory and work towards creating, um, you know, uh, valuing these assets and creating an opportunity that we can invest and, and actually take a comprehensive look at all of our downtown um, parking issues as well as issues citywide within the neighborhoods and uh, generate parking turnover as well to assist with parking issues that do exist for our downtown businesses or restaurants and we get a lot of complaints. And I will note that in doing a little bit of outreach, uh, it, it, we were approached by several um, restaurant owners on Broadway uh, that are desirous of the city looking at installing parking meters. Now, that doesn't mean that's necessarily the answer. Tonight, we're just looking um, to, as an information item, uh, have the city council authorize us to continue to move forward. The next steps would be to conduct uh, significant outreach to our business owners and property owners, um, and then develop a resolution to move forward. I will note just real quick in, in the parking ordinance of 1949, Mike, um, and in 1949, it, it, under California law, every city is actually a parking authority under that law. And so that, that, provides us the opportunity, not by ordinance, but by resolution, uh, to adopt a resolution delegating to the city council or to uh, the city council designating the mayor to appoint members of a parking authority. But once we come back, we'll um, make recommendations for the, for the governance of the parking authority. I mean, we would recommend that it would be the city council wearing a different hat, um, just like you would uh, if you recall the, the previous redevelopment agency, um, and then um, it would be separate, distinct actions and financing uh, if we would get to that point, uh, then general law or the um, general fund of the um, city. So that's a quick overview. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, at this time. Okay, sure, Vice Mayor Schneider. Given that we're also working on a BID for downtown, if we move forward with the parking authority, will that have any impacts on the business owner's vote for the BID? So, so that's a great question. I mean, we, we've continued to work with uh, the downtown property owners. We're not quite at uh, um, uh, over 50% uh, support. Um, but I think that this is another mechanism that as actually a tool to help generate more business. I think having parking turnover and parking availability actually increases value uh, to the property owner. So I think through, again, education and outreach, um, it does not make a difference. But this is an added tool in our toolbox to help economic development and help the downtown property owners and businesses uh, succeed. Second, second question, um, I've been reached or been sent some documents about street greening and we've been having a discussion of mobility. So specifically people who um, have 
a difficulty time walking. So whether they're using one of the paratransit programs that need to be dropped off fairly close to them. If we're t the report talked about street parking, um, I would just have us consider that some of that street parking might need to be a drop off and loading zones. Somewhat like what San Francisco has done with Uber and Lyft so that they're not, uh, what is it called, triple parking out in there. But just consider the mobility issues that are coming in from complete street programs. Okay. Uh, Councilman Lee? Yeah, I think uh, uh, studies have shown that uh, once meters have gone into a uh, downtown, particularly one that's d distressed or stressed, um, it c increases businesses in the downtown. Uh, because people feel like, well, they could put money into the meter, they, have, they should get something out of it. So they tend to uh, buy something. Um, I have a question about the parking lot on um, the, where the farmer's market is. How many spaces is taken up at a farmer's market every Saturday? So I believe all 52 parking spaces, I, I believe that entire parking lot is closed for the farmer's market, but I, I don't know. Well, if plus, I think a few street spaces. I'm going to look to Key Lim to see if he knows the answer to that, because I, I believe so, but I don't know the exact answer, so I might have to get back to you. Actually, the whole parking lot. No, the whole parking lot is actually used by the uh, farmer's market on Saturday. I'm thinking we can actually get more parking if we put move the farmer's market onto a, into maybe La Cruz where we, we will lose less parking spaces um, and there's not a lot of traffic on that anyway. Um, or, you know, we can move to City Hall parking lot too, but my point is that we can free 52 parking spaces for, sa for, for, a res for our uh, businesses on a Saturday morning. This is one of the most impacted areas and this is where we've received uh, mm -hmm. feedback from the surrounding businesses. Um, for the city to look at increasing parking and parking turnover. It's very congested. Uh, yeah, I recall it might have been a, a, a few years ago. I don't know if, as I recall, I believe we had talked to the Millbrae Square owners about possibly moving the uh, farmer's market to um, the parking lot across from City Hall over there, and I, it, it was not successful, right, as, as I recall. It wasn't a no. It wasn't a flat no. It wasn't a flat no. Okay, so maybe it would be worth, you know, at least having that conversation again. I, I, I don't know if it was them that were not interested or maybe the chamber was not, it was the chamber. chamber that was not interested in moving it. If I can oh. just comment on yes. that. When I talked to the chamber about it, somewhere near there is a storage facility where all the tables and awnings are kept. So it's very close to the chamber's office and the ease of getting those tables and tents out. So if there was a discussion of moving the farmer's market, I hope we'll work with the chamber, but they're going to need a new storage location. All right. Uh, yes, uh, Councilwoman Oliva. I, I think this is awesome. Thank you for bringing it forward. And I think that, you know, we all have to be very um, fiscal minded to what our assets are. And this is a huge asset for our downtown and to move towards the BID. Um, but I don't want to leave out the neighborhoods because we all get the phone calls all week long. And I think it's very important that we take care of our people as well as our downtown. So. In conjunction with this, I'm hoping that we are um, prepared to uh, get some neighborhood meetings together and make sure that a loud and clearly elder gets taken care of. Sorry, Councilman, when, Councilman, when you say that the neighborhoods are taken care of, are you saying that we need better enforcement in residential areas? Or are we saying that we need meters in residential areas? No meters in residential. Yes, thank you for clearing that. So, enforcement. And uh, I think that um, particularly on Elder, they're talking ab about possibly wanting to have parking permits for their, and so they could park in front of their own home during the day. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think that has been a question of concern is, you know, are we doing enough enforcement of the areas where, you know, there are permits and, you know, two hour parking. Um, I've been told that, you know, residents are paying for permits and there's no enforcement in their neighborhood. And so what are they paying for? Right. Um, but yeah, I, I, looking at the um, staff report, it mentions Magnolia would be included and much of Magnolia. Uh, hopefully, you're only talking about the area next to maybe Millbrae Square and maybe next to 
that parking lot and not the residential portion of Magnolia? Yeah, so that's one of the things that we want to study is the parking authority Boundaries Better define the boundary. Should it just be within the central business district and core of the city, or should we, okay. you know, um, have a, a citywide geographic boundary? Um, in talking and, and answering some of the questions of the council members, um, 300 block of Elder, uh, we are moving forward uh, with notification um, of the residents. It's is it 75 percent? 75 so 75 percent of uh, each of the property owners on a block have to agree. I, I think I said it was a, a simple majority, but it's 75 percent have to agree um, to uh, uh, permit parking, residential permit parking program. So on the 300 block of Elder, I know Mr. Peekler um, has been very anxious in, in moving forward with that. And so we are addressing that um, and it is a, a immediate uh, concern for us. So just just so, since you have the mic, can you tell them how the process works? Sure. I'll, I'll hand over Key. I left my notes on my cell phone to go paperless because Key texted me. So <laughs> Key has the information. So I'll turn it over to Key Lim, our uh, public works. Thank you. Asking community development directors. So we, we, uh, we have a petition process as, uh, in according to the city ordinance under Title IV, public safety. It is under uh, preferential uh, permit parking program. So we mail petition to actually uh, the current boundary for permit parking and to the west at Poplar. So we are proposing to city council, we will bring an item back to council at the next council meeting to expand the residential permit parking boundary to Palm Avenue in the interim period. And also including Richmond Drive. We are going to expand the residential permit parking boundary on the west side all the way to Palm Avenue from currently uh, which ended at uh, Poplar. What about Elder? Uh, Elder is actually one block east of uh, Palm so that we include it. So the two blocks that will be included will be Elder and Palm and all the way up to Richmond. And you're mailing out, sorry, are you mailing out a, a per, uh, petition now? We mailed the petition now I believe today to all of the newly uh, expanded area but council we need to adopt a resolution at the next council meeting in order to do so. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I, live on Palm I live on Palm Avenue. Um, again the house is in a trust so it's not mine but I'm going to have to get clarification of whether I can be part of this discussion then. This is not on the agenda tonight. I know but I'm just putting it out there because you just talked about Palm Avenue. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I, I've probably been more hesitant than others on the council to pursue um, permit parking. Um, I, you know, I think, I know we're one of the few cities on in San Mateo County that does not have permit parking uh, in our downtown. I think, in my opinion, um, you know, our, our downtown needs help and uh, I certainly don't want to do things that d would discourage people from coming into Millbrae. Um, it was interesting to me to hear that several business owners have asked for this. Um, that, that was a bit surprising to me. Um, but I think, you know, if we do go down this path, I would like to see a bit more community outreach, maybe uh, a community meeting if that's uh, might have to wait a couple months before we do any special meetings with the, the virus outbreak. But uh, I, I think it'll be a shock for a lot of people um, to see permits come in. And, you know, people have lived here many years. They're used to parking downtown. Um, might have to drive around the block once or twice to find parking, but know that they can park and not have to pay a meter. And it's it's going to be a big change, um, it, it, you know, if we, if we do go down that path. Um, so I think outreach and uh, getting public feedback is going to be critical. Um, we do have a speaker slip on this item from uh, Vince Musi. Mr. Mayor, just real quick, yes. on, on the residential permit parking program, although we're going to bring a resolution that expands the boundaries, that does not mean that every block we would implement residential permit yeah. parking because each block must have at least 75% of the property owners agree to the implementation or just expanding that. You know, if that's the case, then that's the boundary. So I wanted to clarify that it's not automatic. Okay. Thank you. I'm Vince Musi. I, I live in Hillsboro, but I'm, I own a home, my mom's home on Elder. And I have to tell you, the problem on Elder uh, is not uh, commuter parking or people in the downtown. 
we've had probably a two-year period where at least two homes at a time on the block are being renovated. My mom's home right now is having the bathroom redone. And so between workmen and whatnot, that's what's created the problem on, th on the 300 block. It's not, uh, I mean, I, I can just tell you, th there's, there's at least five trucks that get parked there every day, and they're workmen who are working on these different houses. Um, what I put the slip in for, like I didn't know you were going to go that way on, on Elder, um, is, is the parking district. And um, I really encourage you uh, to look at Two, there's two really big issues here. One is what you do with the downtown and the spaces that the city, the thousand spaces that the city already has or controls. Um, the other has to do with site one. And I encourage you to not, you, you don't have the same issue with site one that you have with the downtown. Here you have an opportunity to do something that is going to make a difference with regard to the relationship that the city has with California high-speed rail, with BART, and with Caltrain. But if you wait six months before you initiate something, you are going to lose that control. You need to create, I mean, I would encourage you to create a district for Site 1 immediately or as soon as council will allow you to so that you can begin to look at the area for a parking uh, structure that would create the opportunity to do all of site one. Uh, you've been waiting for redevelopment to come back. You don't need redevelopment to come back. You have the opportunity to have your own redevelopment through a parking district. And if you don't take advantage of it, you will lose control. You have control, you have a plan. You, the Millbrae Station area plan provides for parking. You don't have an environmental issue. You have the authority to do it. You have the opportunity to do it. And I really encourage you to not take six months. You should be able to get it done in two and a half. And I would encourage you to, to move that way. It doesn't, it doesn't require you to do anything in the downtown, although I have to tell you, I've lived in Millbrae and done business in Millbrae all my life. You need parking meters, okay? Uh, it's, it's odd to me that a city gets a fraction of its sales tax recovery. You get 100% of your parking tax. If you have a problem with the business community, maybe think about cutting your, your uh, sales tax. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and go, for, and go for, the, for the parking. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Ron Raquel. Hi, good evening, City Council. Uh, I'm just kind of uh, shocked about the expansion of the parking permit that you are suggesting. Uh, I live on Willow, and uh, there is absolutely zero enforcement. Uh, we pay for parking permits, $25. It's a drop in the bucket, but there's actually zero enforcement. I feel like I've had to snitch a few times on uh, uh, people that have parked in our neighborhood and feel that the city is uh, very lax in that and it's, it's due diligence on the city if you're even expanding that up to Palm Avenue uh, where is the enforcement I, I stay at home almost pretty much all day and there's zero enforcement and uh, are we going to have our residents be snitches I understand that the city is uh, a pretty wide city but you're I've brought this up on numerous occasions that there's no enforcement and it's just shocking that you want to expand it when you don't even enforce what we're doing right now. I mean, that's great that you want to have the parking permit, but where is the teeth in this? I mean, it's senseless. I mean, we had this, when we initially put the parking permits on Willow, uh, we were fearful of the BART parking situation, but now it is going to be exasperated since we're going to be losing the uh, parking a lot down at BART. So, I mean, what is the city's solution to enforcing the parking permit that's already 
in place on Willow and Lewis and Poplar already. And that's my two cents. I just wish there would be a little more enforcement with this. I mean, it's senseless. I mean, I feel like we're just collecting money and just doing nothing with it. And thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Raquel. All right, so um, this is only an information item for tonight, so we do not need a motion, but um, we will um, continue to, to uh, follow this and um, continue to do outreach and, and uh, perhaps bring this back um, at a later date. Clarification. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I would like to see this move not six months from now, but um, if we could move forward with this. But I do agree with the mayor be, being open. And I would like to also reiterate that I have been approached by some of the businesses asking for this. So that is out there, but let's get a clear message from our businesses and our residents. Thank you. Okay. Can yes. we, my question is, can we go forward with creating a parking uh, district, but as to how we're growing the permit area, do that as a separate process so that that public outreach process doesn't hold up the creation of the district itself? You know, I'd, I'd like to uh, look to uh, our city attorney, Mike Connor, and I do believe that we could set up two different boundaries or three different boundaries. So to address the, you know, Mr. Muzi's question about establishing a parking authority over in the transit area, immediately, I think a resolution, we could do that. We call that, you know, parking district A, then we can go parking district B in the downtown and then address the residential. The, the, let me just real quick to address the citizen's question. The problem is we don't have a comprehensive parking management plan. We don't have any revenue coming in other than, you know, $25 per permit. That's not enough to augment our parking enforcement and our con e either our own or our contract with the sheriff's department. This allows us to comprehensively look at the city generate revenue up to about $3 million a year and put that back into our parking program, not only capital improvements for parking, parking garages, but also uh, the management and enforcement of parking. And so that's that's kind of, you know, the, the objective of one of the objectives that we're trying to achieve here. So I would prefer that we do the part that we need around the BART station as quickly as possible. And then just to go somewhere else, I've received a, a vice mayor letter, but it's unsigned, and it's about the 500 block of Poplar Avenue and cars that haven't moved for months and months, which then makes it difficult for our street cleaning program and with all the street trees you have in there. So when we do start working on that parking permit, I'm going to turn this over. I have no way to respond back to the resident, but they sent me photographic evidence. But I think this could work in nicely with getting back to where we used to have a street cleaner that actually cleaned the gutters and not the middle of the road. All right. Um, let me just, I want to clarify something. So the process for creating a residential parking district is completely separate from the creation of a parking authority, one or two of them, except for the fact that, as the city managers indicated, um, if there's revenue coming in from the parking authority, that could be used towards uh, more enforcement. But uh, those are separate processes. Okay, uh, thank you. And let's go ahead uh, back to item eight, the public hearing regarding the underground utility district. So, Mr. Mayor, just, just real quick, um, one, of the, one of the things I'm trying to do on these items is get concurrence of the majority of the council that, yes, move forward. And if, is there agreement mm -hmm. uh, to move forward? Um, quickly with a resolution to create a parking authority in the transit area, to, including TOD1, and then come back and create parking district area two uh, within the downtown area. Yes. yes. Okay. And in regard to the transit center, um, I don't know if this connects with uh, the comments about TOD1, but um, California Drive, there's people parking there all day for BART, especially now that BART's removed uh, several hundred parking spaces. So um, I, I think, if anything, that's a, an area where we could put meters up uh, right away um, and doesn't have any impact, positive or negative, to the downtown. Yeah, correct. And that, and that was a direction of the city council um, several months ago. Mm -hmm. And we're moving forward with our traffic engineering uh, analysis to come back to the city council and actually that would be the first installation of parking meters is on California Drive and extend the um, parking and meter parking on the city's own lot uh, there. Um, okay. Great. So that, that's in progress. 
Thank you. Okay, so item number eight. Sorry for pulling everything out of order. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, member of the City Council, Key Lim. Uh, first, uh, please uh, replace uh, page three or four of the staff report that City Manager Tom Williams handed out earlier at the beginning of the City Council meeting. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, page three or four. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lim, uh, do we need to open a public hearing? Um, Yes, yeah, just this, this declare is it a, open. This is a public hearing item. Mr. Public Chair. hearing is open. Okay. So tonight we'll be discussing the underground districts along Millbury Avenue from uh, Magnolia Avenue to Minorca Way. So what is? How do I do next? It won't go. So what is undergrounding? Undergrounding is actually undergrounding of the overhead power transmission line in Route 20A. I will take a minute explaining what is Route 20A. So Route 20A was created in 1967 by California Public Utilities Commission. It sets aside some funding so that each of those local jurisdictions can have money to underground uh, their overhead transmission power line. So as for Millbury, we receive almost $80,000 in credit a year. And then if I recall, I went back into history, historical file, we did an undergrounding project back in the mid 90s up in the uh, Cappuccino parking uh, triangle area. So with about $80,000 $80, of pg and Route 20 credit that we receive every year so far today, we have approximately $3.4 million in our uh, credit to allow us to move forward with another undergrounding project. And also according to Route 20A, we could also borrow up to five years of future credit. So with that being said, currently we have approximately $3.8 million in credit so that we could uh, do some undergrounding power line along Millbury Avenue. So the reason why we are moving forward with a resolution tonight asking the city council to adopt a resolution is because CPUC uh, established a new rule late last year. They are gonna be starting to divert funding from inactive jurisdiction like Millbury. Inactive, the definition means that any district or city that has not have any undergrounding project or activity in the last eight years will be deemed inactive. And they would have the opportunity to divert funding to other city that in needs of through 28 money. So that we've been notified 20,000 of our credit would likely be reappropriated if we do not adopt a resolution. So it is important that we do so tonight. So currently under title um, chapter 8.30 of the Millbury Municipal Code, city council need to conduct a public hearing and then accept public comments and then to adopt a resolution forming an undergrounding district and this is what we are asking the council to do tonight. So public hearing notice was actually sent out on February 28, meeting the 10 days noticing requirement along the project frontage. And those are about 41 homes. And I will show you the boundaries of the uh, undergrounding district. So the un undergrounding district will be along Melbury Avenue, like I said at the beginning, from Magnolia all the way up to Minoka, about eight to 10 blocks or so. And they'll involve 41 homes at this time. So here are some of the pictures showing some of the uh, overhead transmission line along Millbury Avenue, and they are not the prettiest sight. So based on engineering estimate, we think it will take about $3.9 million to $4 million to underground the full project, but we could do that in phases, or we can start planning the project now and maybe look at uh, some other out, uh, sources of funding to complete the project. And we have until the end of 2024 to do so. So 
the recommendation to, uh, tonight from staff is that council uh, open the public hearing, which you already did, and accept public comments and close the public hearings and adopt a resolution, uh, resolution forming an underground, uh, underground district. So the next step, once the council adopts a resolution forming the uh, district, we will be working with pg and &E with the agreement and bring, them, uh, bring the agreement back to the council for execution and action. And also uh, any type of uh, construction project will be brought back to the council for uh, action. So with that, I'd like to take any questions that the council may have or the public. Any questions? Yes, Vice Mayor. Um, I'm all for this. Let's go forth. Let's do it. Two questions. What will Pete, because PG&E is going to be doing a great deal of the work, what if they get close to any trees at all that they decide they want to cut down? Do we have measures in here to protect trees? And or if they do accidentally cut something down that we at least get a four to one or whatever we've learned from the experience on Richmond Drive? Hopefully by the time that we have the undergrounding project underway, we would have adopted our city uh, tree ordinance and in which uh, we will have the replacement ratio and the type of street trees that we would need uh, pg &E to uh, replace. So I didn't know in the rare, whereas is, I'm not a huge one on whereas is, but would it hurt uh, to include something specifically that talks about trees since there's at least two incidents I know where pg &E has just come in and cut including the ones that I didn't know about, the ones behind Bayside Manor, huge eucalyptus trees. So actually, uh, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Schneider, with the undergrounding project, there will not be a, a, a necessity for pg and &E to remove those trees, and that's the reason why we are putting all these overhead transmission main underground. Okay. I just don't trust them, so I just want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on them. Well, I, I think that's a wonderful thing about this program is is we're undergrounding the utilities and it will actually protect trees rather than the you know the easement and and the issue with the trees growing into the power lines. And I don't want to get sidetracked here, but do we have any update on what's going on with Richmond Drive? Is, are there any trees coming? I know I, I saw the little shrubs that were planted, but are, are we ever going to get trees back there? Uh, short answer is no. This is what that we have worked with pg and &E to come up with, and we actually carry the landscape theme to the uh, uh, first uh, three blocks all the way up to Lincoln Circle. We have put in some drought tolerance uh, ground cover, and we have those uh, 15 gallons crepe myrtle, and that will take some time to grow and mature. And, and so those crepe myrtles grow at a mature height of what is the height limit that pg and &E will allow. All right, well, that's better than nothing, I, I suppose. All right, so uh, I think we need to close the public hearing first. Um, well, let's just go with the motion we already have up on the board. We have a motion and a second. Uh, your votes, please. The motion to close the public hearing passed unanimously. Okay, and do we need, uh, I guess we need another, if we can clear the board. And a motion uh, from Councilman Lee and a second from Councilwoman Pappen to adopt the resolution. Uh, your votes, please. Item number eight passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Lim. Okay, uh, next we have item number 11, which is accepting the fiscal year 2019-2020 mid-year budget report and adopting a resolution amending the adopted budget. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Emily Boyd. She's our interim finance director. I think most of you have met her and I've introduced her at the previous meeting. So, Emily, welcome. She will be providing the uh, staff presentation this evening. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. I'm Emily Boyd, Interim Finance Director, as the City Manager has stated. Um, <clears throat> we're here to talk about money. So this is the mid-year budget update for the fiscal year 1920 with proposed adjustments to the operating budget. Normally, a mid-year budget update would take place around <clears throat> 
would be effective December 31st, and you would hear it sometime in January. We're a little bit behind schedule here, so the figures that I'm giving you tonight are as, as of February 28th, so it's closer to where you're actually hearing the report. This slide compares the budget to actual on the general fund revenues. As of February 28, 67% of the year has passed. Therefore, we would expect 67% of the revenues to be of the budgeted revenues to be collected. And you'll see here that, as the chart shows, the revenues for property tra tax, TOT, and all other revenues are tracking close to 67%. Uh, sales tax will always lag a little bit behind uh, due to the receipt of sales tax revenues. Sales tax will always lag a little bit behind due to the uh, receipt of sales tax revenues th two to three months after they're collected at the point of sale. And note that TOT is 26% of the general fund revenues, and sales tax are estimated to be 10% of general fund revenues. So that's 36% of our general fund revenues come from sales tax and TOT. That's a pretty large pr proportion. Uh, we're watching revenues, revenues very closely in these categories because it has been reported that there's a drop in hotel occupancy as well as a drop in taxable restaurant sales. We do not yet know how that will impact us in the coming months. Remember that the numbers I'm giving you tonight are as of a point in time. Um, and we, like I said, we just don't really know what's going to happen in the coming months. Additionally, the coronavirus could affect the public's attendance or uh, at restaurants or in hotels. And additionally, we haven't had a recession yet. And as you know, I'm sure, the economic site is, economics are cyclical. We have a growth period and then we have a decline period. And it's been a while since we've had a decline period and the economists are predicting that a recession may come pretty soon. We don't know. Back in 2018, I was being told by economists that the recession would occur in 2020, but it hasn't hit us yet. So we don't know, what I'm saying to you is we don't know what the future is. So we are keeping a very close eye on our revenue expectations. <coughs> And we're proceeding very cautiously to limit expenditures to things that are absolutely needed. So here's the adjustments that are being proposed for the general fund revenues. Um, it's a decline in general fund revenues of $228,411. That consists of the property tax revenue has uh, been reduced by 581000 due to a countywide shortfall in funding property tax in lieu of vehicle license fees. This is offset by an additional 362000 coming from ERAF, which is the Educational Revenue Augmentation fund, so we got some excess funds there, and we are projecting an additional 11,000 increase in other property tax categories. So the net change to property tax is a negative 207,000. Sales tax is projected slightly up based upon the consultant muni services projections, and like, as I said, remember, this is a point in time. Um, <clears throat> Franchise fees are slightly up. The increase in TOT is attributable to residential rentals. Business license collections have been improved. The use of money and property is interest income and rents on properties. And it's also going up a bit. The grant adjustment is a deferral of a one, one Bay Area grant uh, in the amount of $370,000, which is being deferred until next fiscal year plus a $260,000 grant from the Transportation Development Act for a net uh, reduction of $127,000. Service charges are projected to increase slightly over the prior budget estimate. Operating transfers in includes $30,000 correction to the recognized obligation payment schedule and $163,000 reduction in the amount needed from other post-employment benefits. And that's 163,000 will remain in the OPEB trust, and we can use that in future years. So let's take a look at general fund expenditures. Expenditures also should be 60%, 67% of the budget if you're tracking. 
Um, all of the departments here are below budget estimates for this time of the year. Public safety is tracking just a little bit higher, but that's due to the inc contract encumbrances that have been entered. And as you probably know, an encumbrance is a planned future expenditure. So we're, we're feeling pretty good about where the expenditures are at. We also saw some expenditure declines of $622,235. Uh, this is due to a police uh, um, unfunded actuarial liability refund from the sheriff of $1 million. Um, this reduced the police expenditures. Offsetting that expenditure reduction is a correction to police and fire OPEB in the amount of $304,000 and an increase in services and supplies of $132,000. That results in a net decline in uh, expenditures of 622000 So here we have some special projects that were roll forwards that we need to mention to you. Um, development impact fees, 104000 Business Improvement District contract, 65000 Finance system upgrade. 61,000, information technology upgrades, 151,000, and a fee study of 11,000. So these are ad additional expenditures. So let's talk a little bit about other funds. On Measure W, um, we weren't, uh, the city uh, underestimated those revenues. We weren't sure what we were actually going to get for that. So now we know we're going to increase that budget by, that revenue budget by $140,000. Um, <clears throat> the community center fund benefited from the sale of land in the amount of 2.25 million, and staff is asking for an appropriation of 1.9 million uh, to cover cost in the community center rebuild project. The, uh, in other funds, the sanitation fund has an increase in salaries and benefits, supplies, and services of 320000 The sewer modernization fund has interest from the cash being held by the fiscal agent for the 2018 wastewater bond issue, so that's an increase of 65000 in revenue. There's an increase in the water fund services and supplies budget of 125000 an increase in stormwater services and supplies of 1500 $500 and an increase in the garbage fund services and supplies of 10500 That was that slide. So the requested action tonight is that you receive the report and then you adopt a resolution approving the recommended budget adjustments. Do you have any questions for me? Okay, thank you um, for putting this together in a fairly short <laughs> amount of time that you've been here. Um, you know, I think in light of the virus, I'd, I wouldn't feel comfortable projecting any increase at all to the TOT. I think it's likely going to be a decrease, and obviously we don't know what it is at this time. But um, And I know we do have the, the short-term rentals, which had not been accounted for, but you know, I, personally, I wouldn't feel comfortable today, in, including a $121,000 increase from all we know about the impacts on travel. Um, and if that's taken out, does that affect how we, if it's how we balance the budget or the deficit? It, it does. Um, what what we what I've presented to you in the general fund is a balanced revenue and Understood. expenditures. Yeah. Um, the We've already received most of that 121000 on the short-term uh, residential rentals. And I agree that we don't know what's going to happen with the uh, TOT. And we've been hearing that uh, hotel room uh, occupancy rates have fallen. Uh, but we don't know how, by how much. I mean, I, th I think it would be good to account for some type of a a cushion there, assuming there's going to be some type of reduction yeah. between I don't know, going back the last month or so, at least for some time forward. If you want to take the 121,000 uh, estimated budget revenue out, you can certainly do that. That's your option. Yeah. Um, what it will do, though, is it will take 121,000 then out of uh, unreserved uh, general fund balance. Understood. 
Unless you want to reduce some uh, other expenditure. Right. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I think, uh, you know, obviously we're in unique times. Um, things are changing fast. Um, we are moving forward with uh, pulling together the um, new operating budget, capital improvement program budget for the next fiscal year. Things are going to change, and I agree with you. I think our revenue uh, is going to decline. There's no question about it. Uh, to what degree that's going to decline is something that we're, we're analyzing, and we will be bringing that and keeping the city council updated. Um, obviously Obviously, if, as we understand it, occupancy is down, last report, at 25%. I think that's probably hovering close to maybe 35 or 40%. Um, and then with the cancellation of a lot, uh, I think there's three or four major um, events in San Francisco, conventions that have been canceled. I think that we can expect that we're going to uh, realize some, some difficult times uh, here in the short term. So just be prepared for that. Um, we're analyzing it. We'll bring back uh, a sound management recommendation and plan fiscally. We just need to figure out where it's all going to lay out and how we're going to stabilize. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I know it's it's hard to come up with estimates now with very Im imperfect information. But you know, again, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable voting for a budget that says it's projected to increase for us from the information that we have. At this time, so I think there's two things. One is is this is balancing the current fiscal year be a budget deficit with that, you know, that's correct, yeah. correct. And then the other is because now we're getting into you know the uh, what the the last quarter um, of the fiscal year, um, we'll bring be bringing forth the, the new budget that by law needs to be adopted by July 1st. Mm -hmm. And I'm more concerned. I mean, I'm concerned about the current budget. I'm much more concerned about the adopted budget in fiscal year. Um, 2021, 20, 21, 22. I think that if we do realize in this last quarter or, or third and fourth quarter of this fiscal year, um, if we need to tap into reserves, our, our reserves is in excess of uh, city council adopted policy. So I think there's enough room there um, for this fiscal year. Going into next budget cycle is, is really where we're going to have to, you know, um, mm -hmm. realize some, you know, stricter budget tightening and, 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 and belt tightening. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Pepin? Um, why haven't we spent the OPED, OBED or the, that money? Um, that's, that's like given money. Why isn't that being spent? The 163000 Yes. Uh, Councilwoman Pepin, the OBED money is programmed for f uh, federal fiscal year. 2019-2020, which uh, starts in October. So the project will go out to bid this summer and with the construction happening in the fall of this year. We can't get it done any sooner, given the market and everything? Unfortunately, no. MTC had programmed the money into federal fiscal year 1920 a couple years ago when we were programmed for the OBAC 2. I think that was OBAC 2 that you are referring to, the OBAG, OBAC funding to MTC. OBAG funding, yes. So, I mean, what's the plan for expenditure on that? The spend expenditure will happen this year in the fall when we're actually paving our Larkspur Drive, and the money is earmarked for a reconstruction of Larkspur. That's what it's earmarked for? Yes, ma'am. It would be nice to know where we are on our street paving um, as we progress, but let's spend the money when we get it, shall we? Yes, we will. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman Oliva? On the, on the sheriff's microphone, please. On the sheriff's overpayment that we received, um, is that a one-time payment, or is that to be projected? Overfunding it, of the sorry, speak closer. Time? You're still too far. Oh, the, the overfunding. Did I over? Did, did the, I? the um, unfunded actuarial liability refund from the sheriff. Exactly that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, that is considered one-time. Uh, occurrence. However, we've been advised that there is another year coming, so we may have uh, in the uh, we're estimating somewhere between 900 and, and a million dollars in additional refund coming, does probably in the next fiscal year. Does that just stay where it is? Just stay credit, 
or does that actually come to us? Uh, what they've done is they've reduced, uh, they've subtracted it off of their contract bill to us, so we've gotten the savings that way. Instead of paying them, you know, this amount, we've paid it less than a million dollars. That helps our expenditures. That's correct. It reduces our expenditures. Uh, Vice Mayor Schneider. I've always been confused about sales tax, especially as we lose places like Osh. The current sales tax numbers, are they including the new e-commerce sales tax? The one that we're supposed to get for all internet sales based on the formula that the state was still yeah. trying to figure out? I don't know the answer to that, do you? They do, yes. So we are getting the, some of that money? The proje well, the projection does include um, the internet sales tax distribution uh, to city, which is a formula. Okay. So we don't know about that. And it's probably, I'm, I'm new on the budget subcommittee, so I'm looking forward to having the budget subcommittee first meeting. But um, with what's potentially happening right now with a decrease in property values, at least what I'm seeing down in, and farther down in Silicon Valley, the properties that we've earmarked for potentially selling for the rec center, have we looked at that? Or is that a capital project? And just tell me it'll come It'll come later. I'm just concerned now that we won't get as much money as we were hoping to get from those two pieces of property. Well, our, our economic outlook is that, that properties are not declining in value. Um, and that, that's really not one of the issues that, that we have in terms of revenue. It's sales tax and TOT taxes is, is the big issue um, because TOT's tourism and the occupancy rates are down. But, but not property taxes is, is, is strong. And continues to. And will continue? Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, we've seen a, a, such a significant increase in property values over the last decade that there's always a flattening out, but I think it will continue to remain healthy. We're starting, you know, we're seeing properties turn over, we're seeing new development, we're, we're going to have the entire BART property um, under possessory interest tax on the east side uh, that will, you know, it's not taxable now, that we'll be paying tax. And as we see new development occurring, um, those assessed values will increase and, and generate additional property tax for us. Okay. Can I follow up on that? Um, can you uh, explain the vehicle license, property tax in lieu of vehicle license fee? I would love to explain that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a semester. Exciting. Uh, well, I'm not sure how well I'll do it explaining it, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, the, the vehicle, the property tax in lieu of vehicle license fees, is a hangover from triple flip from a few years ago, as you probably know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> the, this, these funds come through the county. The county has uh, a, an allotment of funds that they distribute to all of the cities in the county. And this year, the county discovered that they were short something like $42 million in distributions. And so all of the cities in the county got uh, hit a little bit in less money than they normally would get. And our share of that less money was 581000 the county has stated that they have gone to Sacramento to say, please backfill this, but I don't know that they have gotten an answer to that yet, whether the state will backfill it. And the $42 million, is that due to miscalculation from the county? I'm not really sure what happened with the county, but I can try to find out for you. <laughs> I guess is it is it like a, a, a calculation error or is it does it represent some type of actual revenue a revenue loss an actual revenue loss I'll have to ask okay. the county <laughs> to find out for you I, I believe it's the revenue loss from the city of California withholding the VLF and the VLF okay all right uh, Councilman Lee. Thank you for your report. Um, I fully support the city manager's assessments, and I think he's already taken um, some prudent steps to limit some of our um, uh, to, try to hedge our our our, our, uh, our financial status of the city. Um, it, it, we definitely know we're going to take a hit. This question is how big is the hit going to be? Um, so. I would, uh, I, I fully support um, taking a look at our discretionary spending. Um, and also, I've always advocated this too, but looking at our uh, discount rate too at the same time, because I, I don't believe that uh, per 
assumption, what was it 6% or 7%? 7%, I think that's really over-optimistic, um, especially right now. So um, I, I don't know, uh, city managers, if, if you could just wave your magic wand and decide we're going to do, uh, assume a, a lower discount rate. Appoint me to the CalPERS board and change some of the policy, and definitely we can have a magic wand that's <laughs> that's, 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 that's raised for sure. I mean, um, but that's I mean that's a hurdle rate, right? So that's a hurdle rate that CalPERS says that if we don't make this investment return, that we're going to build back, you know, municipalities every year that we don't meet our return. That's compounded with the um, you know the GASB 34 and the unfunded liability that they that they've tagged us all for. So um, not much we can do other than you know manage our way through it, uh, have some reserves, and, and continue to kind of muddle through and, and advocate well, I mean, better investment strategies by CalPERS, quite frankly. I mean, at the end of the day, that's I, I've assessed it. I mean, I, I was city manager in 2008 when it, when it was the worst recession in the history of California, and CalPERS returns have been miserable. We have every year, it seems, that you know every county has a grand jury that does an investigation on local municipality, and we'll come to find out. If you look at CalPERS returns um, since you know change the policy and since 2008, where they don't invest in property anymore. They have other policies they don't invest. Their fiduciary responsibility it has, it has really failed their customers, which are local municipalities. So that that is a huge problem that needs to be addressed that I think municipalities have been silent on. Um, but that what does that do for us today, right? I mean, we just have to, you know, continue to manage. I think, um, you know, the uh, reserve policy for the unfunded liability um, was a great decision by the council at the, at the time that you did that. And that will certainly help us in our time of need in situations um, such as that we're going to be facing here in the next year. So, so uh, I'm sorry, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you know, the discount rates come up a couple of times in the past. It, the discount rate is, is an assumption, right? It's not, you know, changing the discount rate doesn't provide actual savings to us, right? It, it just it's just an assumption of what we're going to be paying down the road. Is that correct? Well, it's an assumption by CalPERS and what they can earn on the money that they're holding. And then what they don't earn, they come looking to, for, to us for it. We have to make it so, up. So, but there so early on, like in 2000, right, it was it was 8 or 8.5% 8 yeah. what was the return. CalPERS was meeting that. So in circa 1998, 99, 2000, 2001, um, CalPERS did not bill cities at, at all. There, there was no payment. And then 9-11 hit, and then that was the... Um, uh, um, VLF take from the county or from the state to balance their fund and triple flip and all this stuff we're discussing tonight. But then what happened was CalPERS n never recovered. Their investment strategy changed. They never recovered from the 2002 recession, 2002 recession, and the 2008 recession hit. And they, they have never recovered. And they um, lowered their, I, I call it a hurdle rate, some call it a discount rate, meaning that, you know, you've got to make this return on investment and then they will not build back local municipalities so they move that from eight percent to seven and a half to seven percent so they lower the expectation meaning that hey at least we can get seven percent and not bill you back but they haven't even achieved that return and then so that you know it, it's they have investment policy they don't meet it but they say well then we don't meet it we're going to bill you back and, and that's the, the large bill that we get from CalPERS and all municipalities get from CalPERS every year. But there isn't really something that we can do that would change that bill, right? It's there's, there's nothing we can do co correct except for advocate different investment policies at, at, at CalPERS. And, oh. and I think that they have a fiduciary responsibility to, to their clients, us, the municipalities, that, that they haven't met. But um, I think what we do, Mr. Mayor, is, is, is we recognize it, we budget to it, we prioritize it, um, and, and need to you know, recognize it as such. And that's what I'm advocating, that uh, we uh, assume a, a lower discount rate. So then when they do come short, we have the money available to cover that rather than having to cut services elsewhere or move money around. So if we already know, if we think that it's going to be 6% and uh, so we can plan for that and say, okay, we're going to sock m uh, extra money away and uh, save that for uh, to make up the, that 1% difference. 
Yeah, plan for a 4% rather than the 7% that CalPERS has stated. I, I think the other way to do that is to look at um, the reserve allocation within the budget. And uh, as we've set up a, um, a PERS reserve fund, um, just look at how much money then we, then we can put into that PERS reserve fund and then use that in times of, um, you know, perhaps what we're headed into in the recession that, that would save us. And, and we know that they're not going to make the 7% definitely this year, due to even just from the, 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 the virus thing. So we know they're not going to make 7%. Three weeks ago, I thought that they would definitely make 7%. Now, I, you know, if you look at where the markets have been, I, it, it's very, although they don't, they're, they're, I, I, one of the things I don't know that based on the current market conditions that I want to study is because of CalPERS investment policy, maybe their losses are not as much as, as might be anticipated because they have such a narrow um, width of what they what they invest in. So, you know, it, it, it's something that we need to take a look at. Which would be a time to get out of fossil fuels. Well, they're not. I mean, that, that's one of the industries that they that, that they do not um, invest in any longer. Okay. Tell can we give us yes. an idea of what they are investing? Sure. Yeah, well, well, we'll research that and we'll bring back, uh, or I'll do a memo to the city council on what, what their current policy is. Right. Mr. Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Schneider. this is um, now or budget subcommittee, but San Francisco voters just approved a tax. I understand it could either be structured as a tax or a fee on vacant storefronts. Now, part of me is hesitant because clearly the best thing for Millbury is to get the BID done, and I wouldn't want to do something that discourages landowners. But a vacant store pulls down the whole area on that. So I would like to see that we consider fee or tax on vacant storefronts. I think the BID is an important consideration, and I would... It, it certainly is. Yeah. Um, but it passed overwhelmingly in San Francisco. I question the constitutionality of that, but we'll see what San Francisco ends up with. They also put a cap on biz, or office space, so let's just see how they do. Okay. Um, so we had a motion, looks like, from Councilman Lee. I, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier the possibility of perhaps reducing the uh, TOT budget. Do I have any concurrence on that? Not yet. I think the assumption is pretty safe. And I've, I think I've, there's I mean, going to be an increase this year, no. everything that we've seen. I mean, <laughs> we'll, we'll yeah. We have the next fiscal right around the corner. Uh, well, we're just trying to plan ahead and say, let's let's just be prudent. We know they're going to take a hit, so why don't we just reduce our expectations and not, you know, spend a certain amount of discretionary money to so we have it on hand so we, we can make our payroll, right? So. City Manager, it's my understanding that you've already taken some actions. On, our, on what we're spending? Well, yeah, I took an administrative action to freeze exp all, all expenditures within the general fund, you know, two weeks ago. And so the department heads are notified not to, you know, um, we have an expenditure freeze. So that doesn't mean that we stop in our tracks and we don't, you know, continue to pave roads and, and move forward with our capital and our um, water and sewer fund. This is, you know, um, travel and, and purchase of office supplies and equipment and that type of thing. And if you walk into a restaurant, so you'll deferring. notice that there's hardly anybody in the restaurant, so you can expect a huge hit in, in sales revenues. Yeah, I, I think from our management point of view, and, and Emily, correct me if I'm wrong, I think if it's the desire of the council, and I think it is good planning to reduce that amount because we are going to see a reduction, then we can come back and we can plan for it. And as we close the books on this fiscal year, then we can make adjustments and bring that back to the city council with the knowledge that, you know, right now we're 130 Thirty thousand dollars, you know, over budget because of the lack of revenue in that particular category. That would be my preference. Yeah, and we could like work to we that. Keep, we keep yep. TOT flat, yep. and uh, you know, hopefully we we can beat that. But um, again, I don't I don't think it. I mean, I mean no disrespect to, to anyone here, but um, I, I, I don't feel comfortable voting for voting to improve, approve a budget with a TOT increase from what we know. Yeah, I think I think these are good, solid discussions. I mean, as we said, things are changing every day, and, and it's just happening so fast right now um, with cancellation of events and, and and tourism. So I think we can come back to you with with that um, with a balanced budget and say, okay, here's how we've come up or recommend. Um, you know, uh, budget cuts to achieve that. Question? Or, or use use reserves, you know, at that amount, which is very minimal. Yes, uh, Councilwoman Pappen? 
So I understand on the horizon, too, might be an extreme drop in interest rates. So um, how would we position ourselves to take advantage of that, or how would that impact us? Well, I, I think it's negative for us. I think that the, the, the Treasury bill now is at, you know, 0.5%. So our investment, that's, a, that's another issue. Our investment returns are going to uh, decrease. Well, but weren't our investments, um, were we not making some good money on that? I mean, everybody's been... All the jurisdictions, other jurisdictions, they've been making huge returns on investment up until this point. No, they have. I, so, so this goes way back, if you recall, the Orange County issue with the finance director in Orange County, the junk bonds, and then the laws change. We're really limited in what we can invest, which are basically um, leaf funds, local agency investment funds, which are which are basically T bills, treasuries, which I think at the height between 2008 and now were maybe two percent return at, at the height and now they've yeah. you know a, a very swift and rapid decline down to you know just a half a percent and there's ru rumor that um, in the economic markets that they're going to go down you know to about uh, 0.3 well i'm sorry to hear that yeah, it, other jurisdictions i mean okay mtc has a huge budget but they've made millions on their investment up till this point literally millions so I mean, we should be looking at our investments. I mean, they have a bigger lump to work with, but, So, so you know. in the uh, quarterly investment schedule that we approved this evening in the consent calendar, <laughs> uh, the current portfolio yields an average of 1.99%, uh, while the longer-term portion uh, yields 1.76%. So it's, it's low in most uh, yeah. jurisdictions in, in California, I believe. And, and, well, I think and we're not going to lose that much money if well, it goes yeah, down No, further. I mean, we're on the downside of this. This is a given. But sorry to say, CCAG, everybody else has been making some money here, and I thought we had evaluated taking a look. But we're beyond that, that's not going to help us. To we're, we're governed by state law, and we can only invest in, in a very limited amount. We, we can no longer invest in the stock market. We can't buy, you know, property. It, it, it's not at the jurisdiction of the city council or an administrative decision. It's, it's dictated by state law, and it's very, very narrow. So I, I don't know where these other, we can look into it and find out what they're doing. But um, for us as a general law city, we're very limited. Okay. Um, so do we need, to, uh, are we, are we going to bring this back or move to approve with the uh, amendment? I think move to approve, and then as we work to uh, close out the year-end budget, then we'll bring those adjustments okay. um, to, to the city council, and then I'll work administratively on, on looking for ways to reduce uh, our expenditures by, by the amount accordingly. Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion from uh, Councilman Lee and a second from Vice Mayor Schneider. Your votes, please. Item number 11 passed unanimously. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, only one left. Item number 13, the informational report on the minimum wage ordinance. So, Mr. Mayor, um, Alisa Tierney, our economic development manager, went home sick. So we've got two different options. We can continue this for two weeks and, and have her. She, she's the one that's on the line. Chair Key was going to step up and give the report. But I think I would recommend, um, since Alisa went home sick, that we wait for her uh, to come back because she has most of the information and knowledge on this. Okay. Right. Move to continue. Yeah, I think that's fine, especially since it's a uh, informational report. So let's um, continue that uh, until next meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, let's move on to council comments, and maybe we can start with um, Councilwoman Pappen. Okay, maybe uh, Councilwoman Oliva. Shoot, I'm not ready. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I had Senior Advisory Committee and Heart Board Andy, meeting. you're going to have to speak your mic, please. I'm back here. Um, so, a uh, heart board meeting and city council. It's been a long week in my life, let me tell you. So, I apologize for uh, not being so prepared, but I promise you I've been busy and working hard. Okay. One, one question. Yes. If, if we could get to the senior advisory committee, they're really anxious to know um, on the general fund what the next step would be. 
and I didn't get an answer yet. So if that, if if I can bring that back to the meeting by Wednesday, that would be. Sorry, what's the what's the question? The, we talked about goal setting, and oh. the seniors are anxious to know what the next step for the general fund would. Uh, general plan. General. <laughs> General fund. We went from budgeting. Sorry, uh, the general plan on how we how we're going to take that forward. Um, they would like to be involved with that. So if we can, if I can have something to bring to them by Wednesday, next Wednesday, a week from tomorrow, that would be great. Okay. Um, how about Vice Mayor Schneider? Sure. Um, I want to thank staff for helping CCAG's Bike Pedestrian Committee find a new meeting space. My understanding is our BPAC meeting for the county will be here at the city of Millbrae on the last Thursday of the month. So thank you, staff. Um, I attended, and thankfully not on the city's dollar, uh, the SFO roundtable paid for me to go to the UC Davis Symposium on Aviation Noise and Emissions. And critical to Millbrae was an additional training I took because the airport is going through an EIR or EIS process for airplane expansion. So I took an additional training and then spent some time with one of the FAA regional administrators to learn how we might better um, keep, an, keep an eye on what the airport is doing. Some of the cool things uh, that I learned at, that is different than our own roundtable, we have pretty much concentrated on noise, but apparently within the purview of roundtables, because they're officially adopted by the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, is we can work on emissions. And one of the biggest new emissions that they are concerned about are ultrafine particulates. They had some health departments come and talk about this, and I'll try to do some kind of report uh, but it looks like a lot of the good studies are coming out of SeaTac in cooperation with local universities and county health departments. So uh, given our proximity to the runways, we should be looking at that. Um, and I will be bringing back to the airport roundtable, hopefully our ability to be working on emission issues too. Uh, there was also a discussion of sustainable aviation fuels. In many ways, San Francisco Airport's been a leader for that. So we're one, we, the airport itself got kudos for that. The good side is it can reduce up to 70% uh, of the bad pollution out of jet, burning jet fuel if you can go to sustainable fuels. The bad side is that there's less than 2% available but of that available, we're getting some of it out of San Francisco. Um, it was also a really great presentation on the greening of airport ground operations, which could drastically reduce air pollution as well as noise. So this is coming out of LAX. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion that the event was held in San Diego, so lots of activities that San Diego is doing in preparation for sea level rise um, and inclusion of capture of storm water to reuse on site. So uh, kind of covered a, a pretty good range of that. The one downside, I would say, there were two different sessions dealing with electrification of personal aviation vehicles, general aviation, and whether or not we're going to have helicopter taxis flying all over us. So that is something to keep an eye on. Um, but that, that's, that was my main activity. Absolutely incredible event, very technical, lots of information to share. All right, thank you. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, one other thing. In terms of, of deaths, since we are celebrating International Women's Day, this past week, the original Rosie the Riveter passed away at age 95. She was from our own local area. Um, I actually, I think Jackie Spear had her come to an event, so I think we've recently heard from her. It's our loss. She was one tough lady, one of those women in non-traditional working environments. So my uh, condolences to the family of Rosalind P. Walter, the first Rosie the Riveter. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilman Lee? Um, the uh, Peninsula Clean Energy, they are, uh, they, they're looking at, uh, um, into reach codes and trying to get reach codes uh, passed by cities. Uh, Millbrae's looking into it. Um, a few cities have already approved it. Reach codes are trying to green living, uh, building, uh, building, putting um, uh, regulations and ordinances to build uh, in buildings to make it more green. And uh, looking at, and also there's a movement to, um, by PG&E's uh, utility distribution 
system. Uh, so I think there's a movement to try to get uh, many cities, uh, particularly San Jose and San Francisco, are interested in um, purchasing their uh, the system. Um, I think that's a ways off, but that's uh, one way to want to address the safety issues and reliability issues and also the accountability issues that we've all been struggling with. And uh, they continued, they hired some new, manage, uh, new personnel to address uh, ways we could uh, piece, finish clean energy to provide clean op opportunities for uh, low-income houses and uh, so that everybody can benefit from um, uh, good benefit f uh, in participating and greening our, com our uh, community. And uh, I think that will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Pepin. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, quickly, Mills High School is doing their performance of Legally Blonde. Uh, this come, They had performances last weekend, and the final performances are this weekend, so I encourage everybody to check that out. The Youth Advisory Committee has a chess tournament coming up, and I'm sorry, I don't know the exact date, but um, it will be in the library there, so I encourage everybody to sign up there. Um, thank you to the city manager for appearing at at MTC, we are working hard to keep BART accountable to cleaning our stations. San Mateo County has five different stations, and there is obviously no regular cleaning. Um, and we would also like to improve public safety at all of our BART stations. We will note, too, that there has been some signage put up in the Millbrae Station after 15 years, um, I guess better late than never, as to connecting to Caltrain, but nothing as to Samtrans, so obviously still a work in progress as to our BART station. Thank you for the mayor for speaking for us at Caltrain. Um, we are still trying to work through some major, major issues here and encourage the cities throughout San Mateo County who are also having problems with the Caltrain plan and high-speed rail plan to keep uh, up the battle here. There are valuable alternatives that we are offering. Uh, happy to see Assemblymember Chu's Bill 2057, which is seamless legislation, which this council passed. Uh, Alameda County passed, Santa Clara County, the cities passed, trying to encourage other cities throughout our region to also also support the principles of seamless transportation, which would be helpful to all of us. And Assembly Member um, Mullen has also signed on as a co-author there, so we are working forward on that one. Um, I have a note here, and I can't remember what it's. So it's Project City has proposed, but I can't remember what that means now. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Okay, thank you. It's late. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay yeah, as um, Councilman Pepin mentioned, I attended the uh, Caltrain uh, High Speed Rail local policymakers group um, a couple weeks ago, and um, the meeting was uh, dedicated to high speed rail and the business plan. Um, as others here have mentioned, the business plan has uh, only one very, very brief reference to the Millbrae Station, and it's in regards uh, to uh, eminent domain around Millbrae Station to be able to put in their surface level parking and extra tracks and extra station area. Um, so, uh, you know, just mentioned for the record that the city of Millbrae is not um, in agreement with that portion of the business plan. And I know we do have a, an official comment period, and I believe we will be submitting an official comment before um, that deadline, which I, I believe is in April. Um, so, uh, because high speed rail needs to get this done and get their EIR certified to be able to hold on to some um, federal funding that the um, administration has uh, threatened to take away. Um, I do have a meeting scheduled with the local high-speed rail director coming up in a couple of weeks, so hope to, says that they are may, perhaps willing to help uh, do some, uh, uh, I don't know, some joint solutions that could potentially be a win-win for Millbrae. So um, I'll, we'll see how that goes. 
Um, so you also attended, a few of us attended the Council of Cities um, dinner uh, um, two Fridays ago, and there was a good presentation about the county um, ha has a new um, emergency evacuation uh, system and, and some new software that provides um, information both for residents as well as for um, local um, police and fire um, services to help uh, residents know what the best way is to evacuate in the event of a wildfire or another emergency. Um, they did mention that, you know, all fire chiefs um, uh, are in the county are trained on the system, and um, perhaps at one of our upcoming meetings, we can ask our chief to give a presentation. It was actually an extremely impressive um, program uh, from what I saw, and it shows, you know, what wind patterns would be, you know, if there's a fire in a certain place, you know, where is the fire likely to go? go from there and therefore um, how to get out and it also connects with you know Google Maps and tells them to you know in the event of emergency do not send vehicle traffic through a certain area if people are trying to uh, evacuate um, so it, it would be great if we could have maybe a presentation um, at one of our upcoming meetings just a, a brief presentation for the public um, I think that's all that I have for tonight but we will be closing the meeting in honor of past Lyons uh, District Governor Donald Stanaway, who is also a Millbrae um, business owner uh, for many years. Um, I believe a member of the Burlingame Lions Club, but, um, but a business owner here in Millbrae nonetheless. And he will be having, there will be a visitation this Friday uh, from 4 to 7 p.m. at the Chapel of the Highlands. And a service uh, on Saturday, Saturday morning, I believe. Saturday morning. Yes. Saturday, Saturday morning at uh, the Methodist Church in Burlingame. Um, but if you'd like more information, please contact the Chapel of the Highlands on that. One more? Yes. Uh, right. Right. Councilwoman Pappen? So a community family member, who not, I mean, throughout this, uh, Greg Sinclair suddenly passed away, to, um, I guess, today. Um, so he is his father and the whole family. Um, so if we could also close in his memory as well, please. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we will adjourn for this evening, and we will be back on uh, March uh, 24th, 2020. Thank you very much, and good night. Thank you. Hey, Gina, what's that? Great.